Members of the Council, please take your seats. I now call this meeting of the Cranston City Council to order. At this time, anybody with cell phones, please turn them off. The clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yeah, here. Councilman Stikos? Here. Councilman Botts? Here. Councilman Arquetto? Present. Councilman Aceto? Present. Councilman Santa Maria? Present. Councilman Favicchio? Present. Council Vice President Farina? Present. Council President Lanny? Present. Is there a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the last meeting? So moved. Second. Motion made in second. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stikos? Yes. Councilman Botts? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Aceto? Yes. Councilman Santa Maria? Yes. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. Will everyone please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under public acknowledgments and commendations, are there any public acknowledgments and commendations? Look, Council President? Yes. Um, Council. Council President, I know this was left off the uh, uh, the schedule or off the agenda, but um, I had spoken to um, Mr. Lopez uh, about the uh, mayoral appointment for Mr. Greg Murka to the Cranston Historical Society. Um, I didn't know if it was possible to make mention of it now. It, 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 they were supposed to get a letter to the uh, clerk, and it, unfortunately, Mr. Lopez was sick latter part of last week. So I don't know if it would, I just didn't want him to sit here all night in case we would. Uh, make mention of it or, you know, continue it to another time. Uh, it's a council appointment, I'm correct? It's a mayoral appointment. Mayoral appointment. Yes. It's just a, yeah, there's no vote on that necessary on it. All right, I think it's just a communication. Um, do we need a vote on that? Uh, no vote on that. Okay. There's no vote. Uh, All right. Then it's President. acknowledged. Okay. The appointment is acknowledged. Thank you. Okay. On the public hearings, are there any members of the public who would like to speak on any docketed item? You have four minutes, and uh, people stand in the back there. There are plenty of seats. Please, if you get to sit down, are uh, there are. Uh, fire code violations and stuff that we have to worry about. Yes, Mr. Deboni, your name and address for the rears for the record, please. Lawrence Deboni, Director of Economic Development, City of Cranston. I'm here to speak on the application for CMR Enterprises known as Rafa Yoga of 19 Shop Drive, their request to take advantage of the five-year commercial tax incentive. The five-year commercial tax phase-in program is intended for businesses that are renovating an existing building consisting of a total floor plan of 3,000 square feet and a minimum construction cost of 250,000 square feet, not to exceed $2 million. This tax incentive is only intended for the increase on the assessment of new taxes due to the renovations. Rafi Yoga is, has a building of over 12,000 square feet and has spent close to $400,000 in renovating the business. They have men all requirements. Their current taxes is 29,000 and due to 
the renovations that they made, that they made, the additional tax as assessed, as estimated by the assessor, would be eighty-five hundred dollars. That eighty-five hundred dollars is what the five-year tax incentive would be for. Thank you, Mr. Devoni. Anybody else would like to speak on any docketed item? Please step forward, give your name and address for the record, please. My name is Gail Donnelly, and I have lived at 77 Robert Circle here in Cranston for the past 32 years. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. I would also like to thank Councilman Mr. Paul Arquetto for arranging us to be on the docket again this month and hopefully every month going forward until this matter is resolved. Last month, we appealed to the City Council and Mayor Fung to intercede on our behalf with BASF as our efforts were going unheard. We requested that a communication be opened via letter regarding the demolition of the old buildings that reside on the land formerly owned by Siba Geigy on Mill Street. We would like to know if that correspondence has occurred yet. More than the requested two weeks has passed. All is quiet on the BAS property. I am wondering now what the next project will be besides the ongoing water and uh, soil testing that our committee is aware of. The cold months are coming and we have concerns regarding vagrants, fires, lack of security, and fire alarms in only one of the three buildings. <clears throat> Last night, I attended a memorial for Victoria Alzidi at the Alpine Country Club and was seated at the same table as Mayor Fong. After we exchanged some pleasantries, I could not risk losing this opportunity to ask a few questions. His expressions, or lack of them, and his lack of information regarding our concerns about what lies in store for us regarding the BAS held property led me to believe that all of the hard work that we as citizens of Cranston have accomplished has possibly not even been brought to his attention. I sincerely hope that this is not the case. My requests for a meeting with Mayor Fung have gone unanswered. I was told many times to expect a re return call, email, etc. We only want a small amount of his undivided attention. If Mr. DiCarlo is in charge, could he please respond to our request for a meeting with the mayor? And if this is not under his realm of duties, who can we set up this meeting? Who can, who can set up this meeting for us? Thank you very much. I did say, anybody like to speak on any? docketed item. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not on the docket. Uh, how I, I love, however, I allowed you to speak. Anybody um, else coming forward, please don't speak on docketed items first. Thank you. That's docketed. Yeah, that's fine. Name and address for the record, please. Yes, Alice Patron, 24 Bretton Woods Drive, Cranston, Rhode Island. Uh, here to speak on um, Third item on the docket regarding the resolution suspending enforcement of the ordinance uh, that was put in place in 2009 regarding foreclosures in the city of Cranston. Um, Council President Lanny did forward to me a copy of all the uh, corresponding paperwork for this from the banking division. And my understanding of this is that this is an issue that the banking division of DBR is trying to iron out regarding title questions that could arise with this more than anything. Um, I think one of the most important things, one of the most poignant things that we did in 2009 as a city for owner-occupied properties and for the tenants of properties that were being foreclosed on was provided protections for our homeowners against the banks. The banks, as we know, still to this day, are not in compliance in many ways with Dodd-Frank disclosure law and any number of other issues uh, that have been put in place to protect homeowners. Um, my biggest concern is, as a homeowner, as somebody who's been through this process, as someone who's had a modification 
and had it basically wrangled out from underneath me with prop, without proper disclosure. I think it's so important to leave the foreclosure protections in place the way they are. Um, our law also protects tenants, which the state law does not. Uh, all the more reason why, um, if we make our law subservient to that state law, tenants in properties that are being foreclosed on will have no rights at all. Um, the other issue is that many of the banks, they take properties on foreclosure and in my own neighborhood on Sagamore Road, there's a house that was foreclosed on last January. The house is still empty. There has not been a for sale sign put on the house. The owner was put out of their home and it's still empty and it's nine months later. Um, we have another house in the neighborhood, 206 Deerfield Road. The owner of that property passed away in October of 2011. House is still empty. Uh, the house is literally sitting there rotting. So the foreclosure protections for homeowners are very important. People being forced out of homes that inevitably the banks don't take care of. My last thing I want to bring to your attention is 44 Azalea Court. I, ha I also have a background in real estate. I had clients who had a purchase and sale agreement on that property. Property is now empty. The owner was forced out of the property. Improper disclosures were sent by Bank of America that intervened in the advertisement of the foreclosure. So basically, there is not clear title to that property. And technically, that homeowner who is now out of their home still owns it and has to be re-foreclosed on. The issues are huge. And our protections need to stay. As a community, we need to protect our homeowners. Does anybody have any questions? OK. Um, one other thing I'd like to bring uh, to the council's attention. I did uh, try to bring this up with our city solicitor and our clerk. Um, back in January, I noticed that on an assignment that I have on my own home um, after doing some research that there was a signature on my assignment that was also on half a dozen additional assignments within the city and that person acting as several different capacities on different documents that are in our registry. Documents that the banks use to take people's homes and that the banks use to foreclose. So I was told by our esteemed solicitor and clerk that this is an issue for the Attorney General's office. It has been brought to the attention of the Attorney General's office through Sheldon Whitehouse's office. But I think it's something we need to be aware of. OK, thank you. Right, thank you. Anybody else like to speak on any docketed item? Please come forward, give your name and address for the record. Hello, Anthony Mignatelli, 2 Poplar Drive, Cranston. Um, I've lived there for 20 years. Um, I'd like to respond to um, the Cranston Johnston Regional School um, development. Um, I was at the last meeting and um, we had some concerns. Um, We've been calling the mayor's office for, I've, I've been calling there for like the past six weeks. I go down there, I don't get any response. We, we just need to be informed what's going on. We, we call our councilman, our councilman says he's gonna set up a meeting. We, we, no meeting has been set up. Um, but we, have, we have a lot of concerns about the size of the building, uh, the one that they're gonna build in the empty parking lot there. Um, I was there the other day we got uh, to do some measurements. And if you go from the corner, the inside corner of um, the existing CJCR building, which would be the corner closest to the rectory of the church, and I measured to the, um, to the, to the large trees that looked like it was, it was, they were on the property line, I get 298 feet. I also did a measurement 
from the chain link fence that, that runs uh, parallel so I don't even know the name of that street there, where, um, the back end of Garden City there. And um, for, I measured from there to touching the, uh, the CJCR gym building, and that's 103.7 feet. I, I don't understand how a building of that size is going to fit there. Um, they're, all, they're already short one acre of land. Uh, they're trying to get a variance for it. They, they're also trying to get variances for um, setbacks. They need to park 104 vehicles there. Um, we're short, uh, they're short for parking vehicles on site. At the last meeting, they said they were going to park vehicles where the park and ride is, but that property doesn't belong to them. There's going to be fights over parking spots. Who's going to police all these people? Um, the, other, the other thing is, um, uh, Let's see, be quiet. Uh, the height of the building is 12 feet above the zoning code. Um, we're just asking if, if they would look at this again and downsize it a little bit. And so you could fit the cars, you don't have a problem with snow removal. Um, where's all this stuff gonna go? You have to keep in mind that church will be in, in, in session on uh, Saturday nights and there's three, um, three times on Sunday morning. Um, you look there, there's going to be at least 75 cars per time that there's, there's a mass. They're parking on Poplar Drive, on the big part of Poplar Drive, and they're also parking on um, an Applebee's parking lot. At that time, Applebee's is closed, but on a Saturday night, um, Applebee's is open. It's, it's congested like crazy there. Um, one other thing. Um, I, I've... I've heard that there was a, a planning department, a planning meeting for this project, and um, so I called zoning. They referred me to the planning department, and I spoke to a, a Mr. Peter Lapola. I guess he's in charge there, and he told me that the um, there was a meeting uh, the week before September 12th for planning, and according according to their rules in their department, um, they're supposed to send out letters to people that are 100 feet from the property line. Uh, as far as I know, I went around asking neighbors, uh, no one has received any letters to the planning meeting. Um, that's their rules, and somewhere along the line they weren't followed for whatever reason, I have no idea. Um, this project, the, the best way I can explain it is that they're just trying to squeeze a football into a golf ball hole. It's, it's, if, if I said I wanted to put an addition on my house, they're not going to let me do uh, what they're doing over there. It, 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 it's just insane. It, it's it's going to cause nothing but chaos, and, it, and it's, a, it's a nice neighborhood, and we don't want to see it go downhill. It's not, we're not against the project. We're against the size and there's just not enough um, parking, and the building's too, too big. It, it, it says they're, a, they're one acre of land short. That's a lot of land. That's probably five house lots in Garden City that add up to an acre. Um, I, I've also spoke to uh, Representative uh, Peter Palumbo, and supposedly he, um, well, he did. He sent a letter to uh, Mr. John Landy, the uh, council president, I believe, and um, also to Mayor Fung, council members, Senator Gallo, and I received a copy myself and I passed it to my neighbors. Um, we're just asking if, if this could be slowed down a little bit. It's happening very quickly. Um, you, you go from a meeting back in like May or June and, and then also you're in the planning stages of uh, um, Back in uh, probably uh, early September, you're having a council meeting September 12th, and already a final meeting tonight. This is going way too fast. This needs to be, this needs to be looked at more carefully. And I try to pull building permits in the city of Cranston. We did a spec house in Alpine Estates about eight, eight or ten years ago. It took me eight months to get a building permit. I just can't see how this process of information that they need to gather can go so quickly and, and at, at, a, at a project of this size. And um, you know, the other thing we're trying to do is we, we have a petition right now to make Poplar Drive 
on one way where the houses are, going from Garden City Drive to, um, to Cyprus, like in, in that way, that seems to be a bigger issue than this project. And I, I really Seven don't minutes. understand what um, everybody's looking at, or maybe it's something that I just don't see, but this is a big project. Yeah, it's excuse going me. way too. Yeah, uh, you, you spoke about six minutes so far. Can you okay. kind of wrap it up? All right. And uh, I'm just asking for everybody just to please take a look at it, because us people that work hard, we have to live there and deal with this traffic and anything else that goes along with it. Okay. Thank you for your time. I would have spoken, spoke at it. Anybody else that like to speak on any doctor's item, please come forward, give your name and address. Hi, I'm um, Colin Minutelli, 2 Poplar Drive, also across from St. Mark's, and I also had some concerns about the parking. It does, I have a copy of the ordinance and the plans of this project that's going to supposedly go through. It does say on here that they improved traffic and parking circulation, but I don't see how. Uh, without Poplar Drive being a one-way, I have to say the way it is now, if there's snow on the ground and then this is without any kind of development being there, when church is in session, they park on both sides of the street. I had a 91-year-old man fall in front of my house and I could not get the fire trucks through. There's no, there's no way for two cars to pass, there's no way for a fire truck to pass. And when they park around the rotary and they park around my house, and I understand it's church, but with extra traffic in there, I just see that as an ex extremely dangerous and a, and a safety issue. Um, I also looked through here in several parts, and it seems to try to sell me on they're going to be renting these apartments to elderly people, older people with no kids. It says it once, twice, several times in here. Statistically, single parent households have gone up. Uh, people are grandparenting kids, children, and I know at the last meeting it was brought up that $100,000 of tax revenue would come in with this development, and like we said, we're not against it. It just seems like to be going too fast, going too fast being slipped under the door. I, we don't know enough about it. Um, for $100,000 in tax revenue, they can't guarantee me that this is all going to be elderly people with no kids. So it's typically if they, I doubt if they would deny anyone that has a child. If these children start to go to the school. Um, Cranston charges about rounding up a little 14000 per child. If you had eight, eight kids in there, there's your $100,000 in tax revenue. If you had two with special needs, full-blown special needs, that's a little maybe $50,000 per child. So I just feel like I'm being a little, I'm sold on things that aren't really guaranteed to me on this. But I am very concerned about the safety issue as far as the one way goes and the parking issue. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Matthew Coppa. I live at 11 Meredith Drive here in Cranston. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm here to speak in favor of the project. I am a proponent of the, the St. Mark's project. Uh, I'm here to speak in favor of the developer. I have the, the benefit of knowing Mr. Jordan Durham, who's one of, the, uh, one of the developers. I've worked with him for several years. I've known him for about six or seven years now. Mr. Durham is probably the smartest individual I've ever met. Um, I can count on one hand the five smartest people I know, and Jordan's definitely one of them. I've looked at the plan. I've looked at the concepts. It's a well thought out plan. The, the building, the new building works well. It's a perfect spot for an apartment project. It's a, it's a good transition piece between the existing single family homes in Garden City uh, the Garden City residential neighborhood and the retail components of, of the Garden City shopping center. The, the variances requested, I believe, are immaterial uh, to the overall project in a whole. I, I'm here tonight to urge the council to vote 
in favor of the zone change. I, I think it's a very good project for the city. You know, here we are again with a, with a local developer coming before us, wanting to invest in our city. We, we, we have a, I believe we have a fiduciary duty to take these projects seriously, to listen to the objections, to get past the objections and do the city a favor and, and, and vote in favor of this project. I have the, uh, <clears throat> I'm a member of St. Mark's Church. I've been, a, I've been a lifelong member of St. Mark's Church. I attended St. Mark's School. I've sent my children to St. Mark's School. I know the property well. I know the traffic patterns well. I know the neighborhood well. The, the traffic issues in the, the student issues and the kids in school, you know, th those, are the, those are the common types of objections. I, are they without merit? I, I'm not gonna say yes or no to that. The, should we ever build another house in the city of Cranston where the school aged children? You know, th those, are the, those are the types of objections that, that happen in every type, of, every type of application like this. Um, and I think we need to get past those, those objections, what I call objection for the sake of objecting. We need to get past those uh, again, I urge, the, uh, I urge the council to vote in favor of the zone change. Thank you very much. Anybody else from the public that speak on any docketed item? Please come forward, give your name and address to the record, please. Uh, good evening, my name is Paul Ruggieri. I live at 99 TP Trail. And I'm here to speak on the uh, docketed item uh, about the resolution granting CLCF the right of first refusal for the Brayton Avenue fields, uh, softball fields. Uh, this resolution was passed by this council earlier this year, I believe it was in March, and uh, I just wanted to update you on some of the results of this resolution. I'm speaking on behalf of a group of parents and taxpayers from the city of Cranston, uh, and, and this resolution has resulted in these fields, uh, in the use of these fields being denied to some girls, and, uh, and, and 10 and 12 year old girls from the city. Uh, we have one instance where a taxpayer uh, was, was allowed to use those fields while his daughter was a member of the CLCF organization, but once he left, he was denied use uh, on his own. We have another instance where where uh, you know, a team from another organization wanted to use those fields just to practice. Uh, and he was denied, uh, even though those fields were not being used at the time. And one additional, uh, one additional result of this resolution is that there have been teams from outside of the city, namely Johnston, uh, Warwick, and I believe Darlington, who were allowed and, in and encouraged to use those fields while you know, our girls are being denied. So I, I, this resolution, I believe, was intended, and, and you, you approved it because you thought it was going to result in, in city-owned fields being used and, uh, to the benefit of Cranston girls and being protected so that for Cran the use of Cranston girls and Cranston citizens. And so the opposite has occurred, and we're going to encourage you to, to rethink this resolution. Thank you. Anybody else from the public to speak on any docketed item? Yes, my name is Thomas Semiclock. I live at 80 Delwood Road in Cranston. That's Garden City. I'd like to start out with the fact that according to the specs you have in City Hall, this developer intends to build a 32 unit behind where the school is now. He then intends to develop the remaining school for another 20 units, which gives 52 units in total. Number one, you're going to lose your buffer zone between the Garden City and the residential homes, period. The required parking by city zoning is not enough, after they get through with that, to occupy itself of the 104 vehicles that are going to be required of those units. The required property setback by city zoning is short by six feet. Required land by city zoning for new building size 
is short by one acre. Required building height by the city zoning exceeds limit by 12 feet. And the area congestion with traffic, it'll make it even worse than we've got already. Anybody else would like to speak on any docketed item? Good evening, um, Mr. Council President, members of the council. For the record, my name is Robert Murray. I'm an attorney with offices at 21 Garden City Drive in Cranston, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the owner of uh, the subject property of Ordinance 7-13-2, uh, St. Mark's Church Corporation, as well as the applicant for the proposed change of zone, uh, which is DMP Real Estate Advisors and Truth Box Inc. With me this evening is Mr. Jordan Durham and Peter Gilcase, uh, who were present at the Ordinance Committee meeting 11 days ago uh, in the public hearing held at that time. Uh, we also have a number of representatives of St. Mark's Church here. Um, the Father Vertilati extends his personal regrets. He is out of town today or else he would be here. Uh, I don't intend to replay the entire public hearing. I just want to reiterate a couple points for uh, the council's consideration because I know most of you are at the public hearing. First, with respect to the process, uh, my client started this back in the spring, going door to door with neighbors, introducing themselves and the proposed project. We held a neighborhood meeting at the end of May at the Cranston Public Library, showed them conceptual plans at that time, invited um, discussion with the neighbors, tried to incorporate some of those thoughts in the ultimate plans that were submitted to the city. Um, by, by no means is this being rushed. Uh, we had uh, numerous meetings with the planning department. The planning commission, as required by your ordinance and state law, held a public hearing that was advertised and noticed to everyone that was entitled to notice uh, for the first Tuesday, I'm sorry, the second Tuesday in um, September. Uh, the Ordinance Committee held a public hearing, again, advertised and public notice was sent out to the required uh, uh, people uh, within 400 feet, not 100 feet of the, the change of zone was advertised within 400 feet. I know there were a couple members who didn't have an opportunity to uh, attend the, uh, on, on the Ordinance Committee, but let me just remind everybody, the property presently is zoned C3 and A8. The portion abutting the Garden City Shopping Center is zoned commercial. Uh, it is that portion that my clients propose to build a new uh, apartment building containing 32 units. Uh, the existing school, a portion of that is zoned A8, which is the residential zone that is uh, seen throughout the, the Garden City neighborhood. As discussed at the public hearing, um, there are many uses that could go into the C3 zone property, which is that blacktop area facing Garden City. Uh, Father Vertilati in the, the church parish, uh, parish council, has um, had opportunities to sell the property to other people, but have chosen not to because uh, they were hoping a project like this would come along that they could support and embrace. The mixed use ordinance is what is before you tonight and the plan that you reviewed at the ordinance committee. The um, this short of an acre and all that, we're not short of an acre for this pro for the building of the, these apartment buildings. Your ordinance says um, for residential use, five acres is required. We have 4.2 acres, I believe. The, uh, but it's within your power to waive that provision. So uh, that, the 4.2 acres comprises everything that St. Mark's Presley owns. Uh, this is a total of 52 units. 27 um, one-bedroom units and 25 two-bedroom. Uh, of the 20 in the uh, existing school, 16 of those will be the one-bedroom apartments, and the new building will have 32, which I believe is uh, 20, um, um, 21, I'm sorry, 11 one-bedroom in the new, uh, new building for, of the 32 units. The setback issue, which was just discussed, involves the separation between the existing gymnasium and the property line. Um, the, the, we are, you would typically require 20 feet 
Um, the property line from the back of the gymnasium to the property line that my client is going to acquire is 14 feet, and so I cited it in, in our ordinance. I really don't think it's relevant in relation to the scheme of the project, but that's what that has to do. The last issue is on the height. Um, in a C3 zone, you're allowed 35 feet. Um, the average grade of this building, the new building, uh, will be 37 feet. However, if people are familiar with the property, the blacktop area is below Midway Road. So we're going to put an underground garage below the, the, um, the 32 units. The average, the, the average height, again, from grade is 37 feet. But from the bottom of the garage to the top of the pit to the roof, in some areas, could be 47, 48 feet. But it won't be noticed uh, because most of it's below grade. This is a good opportunity to have a better buffer between the commercial shopping area and the residential home. My clients are very sensitive to how they do this. They have proposed an extensive landscaping plan. You've all had an opportunity to review that in the packages we've given. We'd be happy to answer any questions. It's an opportunity to take a vacant school building that's been vacant since 2009, put it on the tax rolls, and introduce um, energy efficient buildings to the city, encourage pedestrian traffic with the Garden City Shopping Center, and in the end, yes, generate some tax revenue for the city. Thank you. Anybody else from the public like to speak on any docketed item? How you doing? Jeffrey Barone, 16 Poplar Drive in Cranston. Um, I'm mainly concerned with the parking for this uh, project. They have 52 uh, units coming in, whether it's single bedroom or two bedroom. Um, to me, they said they, I believe they have 1.9 parking spots per apartment. You can't split up, uh, split up a car. It's going to be one or two. Uh, so I think if you have a single family, I mean a single bedroom or a two bedroom, you're going <clears> to <throat> pretty much need two vehicles per apartment. Nothing can be guaranteed whether it's going to be one or not. Uh, so you just can't split it up. And Judge, going back to what um, Mr. Murray just talked about with the, um, they were, they're required to have five acres of land for this building and they have 4.2. Um, <clears throat> he said the, the all of what St. Mark's own is 4.2. Is and I don't know if that's including the church or not because they're not gonna knock down the church if that's the case. So that makes the, the property seem a little bit smaller than it actually is. Um, I, ju I just think parking is going to be a big issue because uh, there's a lot of kids. There's a lot of kids in the neighborhood. A lot of people um, that walk their dogs in the neighborhood, and uh, it, it's just if it can't be fully contained, it, you can't spread out because there's nowhere to spread out for parking spaces. Thanks. Anybody else like to speak on any document <clears throat> item?
Anybody else from the public that to speak on any document? Item, please come forward, give your name and address for the record. At the right at the bottom. It, light. The light should come on. It's on. Okay. Okay. Um, again, I'm in favor of the project at CJCR. Um, as some of my uh, neighbors have spoken, I know they're in a, opposed to it, but um, it, it really is a good project. And I've been involved with St. Mark's Church for the last 19 years as both a parishioner and on the uh, Building and um, Properties Committee. Uh, I've been instrumental in uh, the, the whole program to uh, develop this property uh, with Father Vertilotti and the rest of the uh, council. Uh, Father Vertilotti, I was on the phone with him an hour or two ago, and he wants to express that he is in full support of this project. Um, again, uh, as Bob Murray mentioned, uh, the school's been vacant since 2009. In the last four years, there have probably been five or six offers to purchase that property, some of which are very large developers, some from Rhode Island, some from Massachusetts. 
The density they were proposing is much greater than 52 units. Some of them proposed a minimum of 80 units plus a mixed use of commercial. As it was mentioned in the past that the uh, property along uh, Midway is a commercial zone. As a real estate developer, both multifamily housing and commercial property, um, I can tell you that if we decide or if, if this does not go through, we will entertain other offers on the property and they may see a commercial development there. We're just not going to have a choice. We can't leave that property vacant anymore. Um, it's, it's obviously fallen to disrepair. St. Mark's has put a tremendous amount of money into that that they'll never recoup. And something needs to be done with it now. The developers have put together a very thoughtful, sensitive, and as far as I'm concerned, low density plan uh, to, to build out that property. It, it's, the neighbors have to understand that if something else can go in there, and you're going to see more density, or you're going to see a commercial use. My children went to CJCR, and as I mentioned before, when I dropped my kids off and when I picked them up, there was a lot more traffic there at that day, certain times of the day than they're ever going to see with 52 units. Um, I know they're short a little bit of parking. It's going to be negligible. There's, there's no parking in that back area now, so all their parking is going to be contained with, within the development they're proposing. You're not going to see any of that spill up parking onto the street. Um, I, again, I applaud Jordan and Peter. I think they've done a great job, and I would appreciate your consideration for the project. Anybody else? Would like to, yeah, please give your name and address to the record, please. My name is Severus San Martino. I'm a trustee of St. Mark's Church Corporation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been a Quinnison resident since 1957 and a Garden City resident since 1967. As a trustee of St. Mark's Church, I can tell the members of the council and president, we've had many, many meetings relative to this project. We had many meetings as to exactly what we were going to do with that so-called school building which has been vacant, as Mr. Moria said, since 1907, uh, 2007, I'm sorry. After consideration of many offers we had, some which were very appealing, I have to say, we turned them down. Why? Because we took consideration of the neighborhood, especially the neighbors who were, who were people who lived near the church as to what these projects that these other people wanted to perform would do to the neighborhood. When this offer was made, we looked at it very closely. It wasn't an overnight decision. We've had at least six meetings on it. And I can tell you Father Vertolotti lost, literally lost sleep over this project. Why? The last thing that St. Mark's Church wants to do is to offend anyone, including the neighbors. Yet, we said under the circumstances, what could be better than housing for people? What could be better for St. Mark's for housing for people? And I think all the objectives are forgetting when they talk about traffic, how much traffic there is daily just on Garden City Drive, I know because I walk it. <laughs> and I can see the cars coming in, not stopping in stop signs, etc. However, on Mass Day, whether it be at Saturday night, or Sunday, traffic, except for the people attending Mass, is minimal. And I can say that with authority because I've counted them. <laughs> one Sunday. All I want to say is St. Mark's Church Corporation heartily approves of this project. And we certainly will not, under any circumstances, approve of any project which is going to offend anyone, including the people who live nearby. I honestly say that some of the objectors, respectfully, are, respect, uh, are objecting on some agenda we don't know about, if they would tell us 
come to our meetings and tell us what the objections are. We just don't know them. Based on that, I say to the council, please, please, under the circumstances, approve this project. We need it. Thank you. Anybody else in the public like to speak on any docketed item? Hearing none, public hearings, um, docketed public hearings are now closed. <clears throat> Moving on, um, ordinance 8-13-2. Okay, before we begin, we need a resolution uh, suspending enforcement of ordinance 2009-60 foreclosure requirements for owners occupied residential properties for duration of period in which Rhode Island General Laws 34-27-3.2 uh, remain in effect. <coughs> mm -hmm. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? Yes. Councilman Aceto. Yeah, we to suspend the rules at this point. Then we'll vote on the resolution. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Councilman Santa Maria. Yes, I would like to ask a couple of questions. Um, I asked the clerk. Um, Through the chair. Is I'm sorry. Uh, was there a motion? Who who made the motion? I, I, I missed that. Motion. And the second. Thank you. I asked the clerk who sponsored this or who asked this uh, resolution to be put forward to us. I was told Rhode Island Housing. Uh, Council President, anyone here from Rhode Island Housing to answer any questions on it? Is anybody here from Rhode Island Housing? I guess not. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of concerns about this. Number one is why this resolution is asking us to not enforce a, an ordinance. I know the answer would probably be that the state has an ordinance already in effect. Um, but to be perfectly frank with you, we're having trouble getting the banks now to take care of foreclosed properties, as I say, every month. So uh, my next question, I guess, would be who's going to enforce it on the state level? But since no one's here from Rhode Island Housing, I don't have an answer to that either. So I would respectfully ask that we don't vote on this or table it till next month till we get someone from Rhode Island Housing here. Uh, the city clerk, you were in touch with Island Housing concerning this resolution? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the initial communications uh, came from Rhode Island Housing. Um, they, w they came to myself and also to the administration. Um, what happened is the state this year passed a foreclosure mediation ordinance requirement which mirrors ours as well as several other communities. The state statute, the bill clearly states that it preempts local um, ordinances that are inconsistent with the provisions of the state statute. And there, the state statute is in effect until July 1, 2018. Um, I'm not, I don't know why, but there was, uh, DBR is the agency in the state statute that is given the responsibility of drafting the forms. Um, and making those available, and it was to create consistency with regard to those forms. The notice requirement to the homeowner is the same as what we have on our local books. The mediation process is identical to what we have in our local ordinance um, and the, the affidavits that they need to provide. But where each municipality may have slightly different forms, there will not be statewide forms available. Uh, for some reason, the title industry just I guess had requested, I'm not sure of whom, that um, 
the local communities acknowledged that their local ordinances were superseded by the state statute. Um, section, I have it here, the Senate and House bills are exact. Um, it's section O, oh, any existing municipal ordinance or future ordinance which requires a conciliation or mediation process as a precondition to the recordation of a foreclosure deed shall comply with the provisions set forth herein and any provision of said ordinances which do not comply with the provisions set forth herein shall be determined to be unenforceable. Um, in terms of the enforcement, the, the statute as an ordinance itself is self-enforcing. When someone comes into a file of foreclosure, we do not take it, we review the document to make sure it has the uh, appropriate affidavits from the Rhode Island Housing that they've gone through the mediation process that notice was given. Um, if those are missing, then it doesn't, it's not accepted for recording. Under, I, under our existing statute, that's how it was, and it would be the same with the state statute. Mr. Council President, point of order. At this point, we're discussing the actual resolution the motion on the floor is to whether we want to suspend the rules for it to go forward. So, I just wanted the clerk to read, uh, to explain to us what the resolution says. Uh, Councilman Stikos? Uh Yes. What? What is the rush? If this is, if we're, um, according to what the clerk said, we're preempted until 2018. Uh, why do we have to do this tonight? It, it seems like a uh, somewhat complicated. We had a, a knowledgeable person from the public uh, speak against it, and why do we want to vote on it tonight rather than send it to committee, carefully consider it, and then um, deal with it from there? Uh, Councilman Botts. Thank you, Council President. Um, I echo both uh, Councilman San Maria and Councilman Stikos um, in regards to suspension of the rules. Uh, I, again, what, what is a rush? Uh, I feel very uncomfortable suspending the rules when there's no representation from Rhode Island Housing. Um, so I would suggest uh, to not suspend the rules and, and go through the committee process, subcommittee process on this. Thank you. Councilman Aceto. Yes, Mr. Council President, just a couple of quick points. According to the city charter, didn't we have uh, some decisions made a couple of years back on who can introduce a resolution? And if that is the case, who can uh, introduce a resolution? I believe it has to be a member of the council. Is that correct? To the solicitor? Uh, and a resolution is an expression of the will of the council. So uh, we did have an issue a couple of years ago, and the question was whether or not the administration could introduce a resolution. I prepared and delivered an opinion that the, re that the administration does not have power to do so because it's an expression of the will of the council, not the administration. But there's no sponsor on this resolution, is that correct? I don't see one on the copy on my That's machine. That's number one. Number two, uh, Cranston is ruled by a home rule charter, is that correct? That is correct. So under a home rule charter, does it uh, that grant us certain privileges on passing certain ordinances and things like that? Uh, Chair, I, a state law can preempt, even if you're a home rule charter, state law can preempt local authorities from enacting an ordinance that's contrary to it. The state law can. Councilman Santa Maria. Thank you, Council President. Um, Attorney Quinlan, so that means the resolution is not needed. It's an automatic preempt preemption of city, a state, city law. Uh, the, according to the terms of the act, which was read by uh, the city clerk, it automatically preempts. So there's no need to, to, to pass this resolution. And I really would feel more comfortable if someone from Rhode Island Housing was here to answer our questions. And we, I do believe we have the right to, I'm not gonna use the word cross-examine, we, we had I don't, uh, a floor manager, there's no floor manager for this bill, so we can't ask the questions that we need answered. So I would think we would push it to next month would be the best thing to do. Councilman Aketo. Thank you, Council President. I, I think my colleague, uh, Councilman Aceto, brought up a very good point. Um, this resolution uh, is not properly before us. We have no sponsor on this resolution, and only a member of the City Council can draft and submit a resolution. So uh, I take it that this is null and void as is, because it's, it's improperly before us. 
Council Vice President Farina. I uh, tend to agree with my colleagues. Um, there's no sponsor on the resolution. There's no one to talk and cross-examine about the resolution. We didn't submit it, so how can we put forward that the will of the council is to pass this resolution if the will of the council is not to pass the resolution? So I agree with my colleagues, and I'll be voting no on okay. suspending rules. Any other discussion? Uh, Councilman Fabecchio. Thank you, Council President. Whether or not we, uh, we want to ask questions about this uh, resolution, basically we have a conflicting statute with, which has no effect at, at this point anyway. I mean, our, our, our ordinance does not supersede state law. And what, as a practical matter, I can tell you that any uh, conveyancer who would be dealing with real estate is going, to, is going to make sure that there's a, uh, a notice pursuant to the state, the new state statute as opposed to the, the city ordinance. And in fact, I think that new ordinance, and the, uh, the clerk may be aware of it, I think it, ex it, it actually expands the time frame to 60 days for this notice of the mediation process instead of the 45, I think, that we had in our ordinance. So it's, it's actually more protection for the um, for the homeowner, I believe, in, in, in that respect. Um, as, and it, if it's geared to owner-occupied properties, then tenants would not even be part of the equation. So, I, I, you know, it doesn't really matter what we do here because our law is not, has, no one's going to uh, comply with our ordinance in terms of doing con uh, conveyancing of real estate. Councilman Acido. Uh, thank you, Mr. While I was the uh, person who introduced that ordinance and got it passed, and it took a lot of work, working with many council members at the time, the administration, Rhode Island Housing, and a group of uh, homeowners, um, maybe, part, maybe part of it um, where the state supersedes it, but what about the people where our ordinance protects as far as the renters? There's no protection under the state statute for renters. So, you know, again, I, I don't want to get into the merits of the ordinance here. I, I just want to kind of keep it to um, the resolution itself. But I think that it was not introduced properly, and, and I agree with you. I'm not an attorney, but I know that if there's a law there, I'm sure there's nothing we can do about it. But uh, to rush this, like Councilman Stikos has stated and my other colleagues have stated, I mean, if we want to really hear this resolution. And by the way, the resolution is not binding anyways. So even if we go through with this and vote that we're going to suspend the ordinance for the time being, the state says that and then there's a sunset clause on the state uh, statute as I read it in the paper and researched it. So, Any other discussion? Hearing none, but please take the roll. A yes vote is to to su suspend suspension of the rule 34B, that's correct. Right. And no vote is not to suspend. Councilwoman Sarah, uh, Sarah Kilsley. Um, I guess we don't. I, I, okay, it's to suspend. Okay, I'll, I'll say yes. Councilman Stikos? No. Councilman Botts? No. Councilman Arquetto? No. Councilman Nacito? No. Councilman Santa Maria? No. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? No. Council President Lanny? No. Motion fails. Uh, <clears throat> next docketed item is Ordinance 8 13 2, Ordinance and Amendment to Title. 5.64 of the Code of the City of Cranston, 2005, entitled the Theatrical Performance says Shows and Exhibitions, Public Entertainment, as amended in committee on September the 9th, 2013. Yeah. Ordinance Committee. No, it's here. Um, Council. Chair Arquero. Uh, Mr. Council President. Uh, thank you. Uh, you raised the point of order. Yes, support. Uh, point of information. The, the, <clears throat> the resolution that we just voted not to suspend the rules on 
Is that going to be referred to committee, or does that have to be no, re- No, it dies. It's just, it, okay, thank you. It's no longer in existence as of this point in time. Thank you. All right, now we go to the Ordinance Committee. Thank you, Council, Council President. Council uh, Ordinance 7-13-2, Ordinance and Amendment of Chapter 17 of the Code of the City of Cranston, 2005, entitled Zoning, Change of Zone, 31 Poplar Drive, 42 Poplar Drive, this passed unanimously uh, out of the Ordinance Committee. Entertain a motion. Is there a motion? Make a motion. Motion, motion to move. approve. Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? Councilman Santa Maria. Council President, I, I was, I'm not a member of that committee. Um, what was the vote on, if I could ask, do we know what the vote on the committee was? Unanimous. Unanimous. Yes. Unanimous. Unanimous. Uh, I it was believe seven it was unanimous. It was 7-0. Seven seven unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Councilman Botts. Thank you, Council President. Um, I'm going to be voting in favor of this um, ordinance uh, for many reasons I spelled out during the, uh, the subcommittee uh, meeting on this. Um, just to uh, expound upon a couple of comments that were made, uh, it, it, would be, it would be a danger to consider other proposals for this parcel of land. As stated before, it's already zoned C3. Any commercial entity could be built on that portion of, or that half portion of land from midway to halfway between, you know, where the uh, gymnasium is. It could be anything. It could be a Walgreens. It could be a CVS. It could be a Brood Awakenings. It could be any type of commercial entity as long as it's not a drive-through. Uh, that would introduce a lot more traffic than I think a 52-unit apartment building would do. Um, there's already an existing building uh, where the school used to be, where I, I believe it was 20 units are going in and, and another 32 units are going in that portion that's going to be set down below grade. Um, and again, um, something was made, a uh, comment was made that the, the neighbors have final, should have final say in what goes in that area, but as of now, you don't. Again, the danger is you could have a business go in there and introduce more traffic into that. And they don't have to come before the council and get approval on that. It's already zoned C3. So there is a great danger in seeking other proposals for that land. Again, a mixed use property, as we're doing tonight, has to be approved by the council, and any changes to that have to come before the council if they decide uh, something's not working. Uh, again, um, there's other apartments in the neighborhood, uh, that complex past uh, St. Mark's Church going towards um, cellos or, or whatever. Um, there are those apartments clustered within there. Uh, and again, uh, and I said this at the last meeting, when the school was operating, there were peak times for traffic in there where who knows how many cars, 200 cars could be going through there, dropping students off in the morning and picking them up in the afternoon. Uh, my children went to CJCR for a period of time and witnessed that at night. Again, there's peak times of traffic when CCD is in session or when there's a ba basketball game going on in the gymnasium. I think the traffic element from 52 units is going to be minimal. And we heard that the school argument um, in a previous uh, development that was supposed to go over near the ice rink. But again, that complex was so much larger than what this is going to be, and I don't think it fit, their development fit into a pl the plan over there. There were a lot more elements in that. And I don't think that school argument works for this piece of land, considering the mix of apartments that are going in. It's almost half and half, one or two bedroom apartments, where the other one was majority of two and even two bedrooms with an office that could be used as a third bedroom. So there was that danger of, of a lot of students being in that other complex, where this one, I don't see that happening. So, and again, you're promoting walking through the city, use of Garden City, it's a green project, and I think it's going to, believe it or not, I think it'll add to the area versus what's there now, which is a vacant building with weeds growing out of the cracks in the pavement and, and that sort of thing. So. Again, I will be voting to approve uh, this ordinance, and, and I, I hope it, it goes well. Thank you. I'll let you go. Councilman Stikos. 
Uh, I had a, a couple of questions for uh, Mr. Murray. If I could. Uh, there's been a there's been a lot of discussion about the parking, and how how will that work? Um, as far as assigning, you're going to have 109 parking spaces. Is that right? No, I think uh, by ordinance. No, I'm sorry. For 52 units, you're required to have 104. 104, two per unit. Um, the I believe the pr our proposal is 93, which is short about 11. Uh -huh. um, so instead of two per unit, it's like 1.78 per unit. Okay, um, but how how will that? I I go to rent an apartment. And you're going to tell me I have one parking space as part of the apartment, or two, depending on what's available. Um, yeah, could I, since he does it so much more eloquently, can I defer to Mr. Durham, and then I'll be happy to answer any other questions. This is Jordan Durham, one of the developers. Jordan Durham, DNP Real Estate, 460 Harris Ave, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, our intention is that the 32 or 34 garage spaces will be specifically assigned to the tenants within the new construction building. Um, then we have the surface parking lots which are sort of scattered about. Um, we've, we've done a lot of study on apartment buildings and generally what happens is you have about 1.5 to 1.6 parking spaces needed for a complex with a unit mix of this type. So there just won't be one, there won't be two cars for every unit. There will be some, some tenants that have two cars, some tenants will have one car. So we will, we will most likely be assigning just the 34 garage spaces, which will pay a rental fee for them, so we can kind of meter that component of it. The balance of them will be, we've scattered them to be where we think they're appropriately cited for the entrances of the building where they're needed. But if, if, I, if I come to rent and there isn't a parking space for me, Every tenant who signs up for an application will submit details on what their cars are, license plate numbers, so we'll know exactly how many cars we have available. They, we, can, we can meter that through parking permits if we had any issue. All right, but we don't, we don't see it as an issue. Our traffic study looked at the Garden City Apartments. The Garden City Apartments have 94 um, apartments in there. They have less than one space per unit. Uh, but I, I mean, if I park my car on the street because you don't have a parking space for me, uh, then I would be violating overnight parking provisions. Right, correct? exactly. Okay. Um, the other thing I didn't understand was the 12 feet above grade and, um, I mean, I know that that grade is like that. Yep. And so is, how far is the, the building above the, uh, zoning requirement, the front of the building, the, the part that's on the, the way that the zoning level reads with the road. on multifamily buildings, it tries to encourage the development of pitched roofs. So it breaks out the, the measure of height from, the way they do it is they measure from the average grade. So because we have the high grade on, on the midway roadside and the lower grade for the parking on the backside, we measure it from the, the middle. So measuring from the middle up to the, the fascia board of the roof, like the right where before the roof starts to pitch, it's about 36 feet. Now that's three levels of living, um, plus a little bit of you know steps to get up to the front door of the building. If you measure it all the way to the very very peak of the roof, it's 47 feet. Um, again, the zoning is, is set up to encourage that, so it's sort of a we're not fully requesting that waiver the way that it's been mentioned tonight, because the zoning actually has language that encourages different pitches of roof and allows you different variances over 35 feet in order to accommodate a pitched roof. So if we were to not have a pitched roof, it would only be 36 feet or 37 feet. And the, and the zoning talks about how many feet? The zoning has a, a kind of complicated formula, the way that they describe the encouragement of pitched roofs. So 35 feet is the base level allowed anywhere in the city for zoning. In multifamily buildings, depending on, on um, the size of the building, you're allowed different heights above 35 feet, depending on what the proposed pitch of the roof is. Is that clear? No, no, but that's okay. It, and that, that's, why we, that's why we specified it this way in the, in the request, was to just ask for more than what we're really looking for, subject to the zoning, because the zoning is a little murky on uh, this issue with bigger, with, with multifamily buildings. Okay, thank you. Council Vice President Farina. Thank you, Council President. Um, I did have a, 
question, but uh, Councilman Stakos got to it, so thank you, Councilman Stakos. Um, in looking at the project, you know, I, I wish it worked like some of the residents said, and we could put forward different projects that we could look at and try to vote on. But unfortunately, this is the project that's before us. So the project that's currently before us is for a 52-unit apartment complex in an area that's zoned C3 commercial. When I look at the things that can go in a C3 commercial zone, you see things like convenience stores, spas, salons, drug stores. I mean, I know car counts and a drug store or a convenience store gets a car count of anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 cars a day. It's not even going to be close to what a 52 unit apartment complex is. If we were put, to put a Starbucks in the C3 zone without a drive through because the Starbucks that's currently in Garden City doesn't have a drive through they would knock down the old building, use it for parking, and have a Starbucks. There would be more cars than a 52 unit apartment complex and you would lose the buffer zone that this project will create. This project makes sense for this area, so I'm going to be voting to support it. Uh, Councilman Aikero. Thank you, Council yeah. President Lanny. Um, I just want to say a few words on this. Um, I want to uh, commend all the uh, constituents coming out this evening and express their desires either for or against this project. Um, I know firsthand that, that Father Vertilotti had a, a, a difficult decision to wrestle with all um, the, the uh, offers that he received. This wasn't the only offer. There were several. And this is the one he chose because he thought it was the best for the community at large because he was concerned about the neighbors. Um, also, if this project is voted down tonight, what does the future have in store? Okay, it may be something that is, is not so palatable. Okay? We know what we're getting here. Uh, I think the uh, owners uh, worked well. There were several meetings that they had uh, at the school. This project came before the Ordinance Committee. It was dis discussed. Uh, it was voted on unanimously. We're here tonight. Um, it's, you know, I think it's a fair project. They're not having um, many, many uh, uh, apartment floors. They're keeping it within the zoning standards. Um, it's, I think it's, it's downsides. It's not that large of a complex. And I think it'll fit well in the Garden City community. Um, it's going to generate revenue for the city, half a million dollars per year. Um, I know there's uh, projects that this council has uh, shot down in the past that were three times the size of this. Um, development must occur in the city. Uh, if it doesn't, your property taxes increase. Uh, I'm going to support this project. I think it's the best one that was received. Uh, uh, by the diocese, and I think uh, the owners were uh, concerned uh, and designed the project to fit in the, with the neighborhood community. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Santa Maria, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you. Uh, may I ask um, Attorney Marty one quick question, please? I apologize, I wasn't at the committee meeting, so if my question is redundant, I apologize. What's the average rent that you're going to be charging at? this complex? Yeah, between 1,200 to 1,800, one bedroom to two bedroom. Thank you. Councilwoman Lee, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I um, I just wanted to uh, commend the community on coming out in force for this and um, say that I think that it shows a strong community presence and um, something that the church has uh, taken into account and, um, and I think they're really trying to do the best thing. It's taken them since 2009 to pick a project for that location and I think it's probably a struggle for the church to remain, have that um, property remain vacant. So um, considering the other options, I think this is a good, a good project. Thank you. Uh, Councilman? 
Thank you, Council President. Uh, since this is my district, I guess I'll have the last word. But uh, regardless of what, what happens here, um, one of the things that I noticed from the neighbors, and I think, and I looked at this today, I went out and took a look at the, pro, uh, the area, um, I, I think I will introduce uh, a, an ordinance to create that one-way um, uh, one street on part of Poplar Drive. I think that that's an issue that really needs to be addressed. The other thing, I've asked the administration, and I know I mentioned it at the committee, and I know there's quite a bit of support. I think we should do some landscaping to, to create a better buffer on the island. There's a, there's a fairly, not too wide, but there's an island uh, separating part of Poplar from uh, the St. Mark's property. And I'd like to see some evergreens of some type or some kind of a buffer planted there with the uh, funds that uh, Councilman Stikos uh, proposed and uh, was passed last year. Um, I think that this would be a great spot for, for something like that. It would help to create a little buffer that they're, they're all looking for. Um, and I think that that's something that we're, I intend to do regardless of what happens on the vote. Um, with regard to the actual project, um, I understand the concerns of, of my constituents and the neighbors. Um, house lots would be great, but I can't see anyone wanting to build a house on Midway with the front, their front lawn on Midway, um, which is com commercial. There's a fact that would have to be, I guess, converted from C3 to residential, and I, and I doubt very much whether there would be enough money for the, for the church to, uh, to do that. Um, I think they've certainly been faced with the decision of looking at CVS or other retail outlets. And, and I've asked Council Vice President Farina, because of his uh, employment with CVS, about the traffic counts. And they can be substantial. That 2,500 a day is, is a conservative estimate, uh, according to his statistics on, on what CVS does. So I really, I really am fearful of 2,500 or more cars a day coming in for t five minute intervals as opposed to people who might park their car and, and stay home for eight hours at a time. Um, I, I don't see the traffic as being a, a, a terrible incident, a problem. Um, I think that the uh, ingress and egress issue, I think the developer spent a lot of time about on the curb cut and changing actually the dangerous curb cut that presently exists. Um, I walked the property with Mr. Murray to, to, to see how that uh, access was going to be. I, um, I'm not sure of the, how they're going to handle the access on the other side if there is in fact any uh, ingress from the uh, Poplar side. Um, Mr. Murray, maybe you can answer that question. Two means of Egress to this project will be on Midway for the 32-unit building and on Poplar Drive for the 20-unit building. As part of the neighborhood meeting input we received, initially all the traffic for 50 units was going to be able to go out through Poplar Drive and the developer listening to neighbors, we eliminated the new building having access out to Poplar Drive. So we minimized that so just the 20 units in the existing school building will have uh, access to their parking spaces through uh, the Poplar Drive curb cut, but not the 32 units. They will go out through Midway. Okay, thank you. And, and lastly, the, uh, the other thing that I noticed in walking that project is there are some parking spaces along Midway that are dangerously close to the roadway itself, and this project is going to move those spaces in about five feet, which I think is going to alleviate something that's fairly dangerous now. And the people park along Midway in that section currently. Um, and when they back out, they're backing out into traffic as opposed to having a, a shoulder area. And I think that's one of the things in their proposal that, that makes some sense, that it will create a little more safety in that area. Um, and I guess, lastly, you know, in terms of who will rent, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a little bit uh, jaded in the sense that in my area, we have a lot of apartments. And they're rented. There are a lot of older people that stay in the neighborhood after they downsize and sell their homes. And I probably have a thousand units uh, right around the corner from me. I mean, it's literally m many buildings worth of uh, condos and apartments. And we really have no traffic problems whatsoever. So um, 
I really doubt that 52 units in this section will, will create more traffic, especially than a, than a CVS. Therefore, I, I, I'm going to support this. Council Vice President Farina. Just wanted to make a statement that not all CVSs are bad. They do still <laughs> pay me. So, um, and additionally, I just wanted to, Councilman Favecchio did tell me about the one-way street and the potential for putting trees in as a buffer zone. And I think it's a council will support those, get some traffic studies done, and try to get that done to support the neighbors. Any other discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please take the roll. Uh, clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stakos? Yes. Councilman Botts? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Isidro? Yes. Councilman Santa Maria? Yes. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. <coughs> the ordinance passes by a 9-0. 9-0. Thank Councilman. you, Council President. Next ordinance is 813-7, um, ordinance and amendment of Title 10, Chapter 40 of the Code of the City of Cranston, 2005, entitled Traffic Regulations for Specific Streets, Crosswalk, Gansett Avenue, North Side, of its intersection with Appleton. Motion approved. Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? Yes, uh, Mr. Cordy. I'd like to point out to Council that the engineering report has not yet been completed on this crosswalk, and if I could take a moment to explain why that is, I'll make it short. When this uh, ordinance was introduced to the Ordinance Committee on 912, it originally was asking for the uh, location of the crosswalk to be at Gansett in Berkeley. And at the Ordinance Committee meeting, it was amended to Gansett in Appleton. Now, it certainly doesn't sound like a big change, but when we're putting a crosswalk mid-block in a busy intersection or a busy road like Gansett. There's a lot of things we need to take into consideration because we're talking about pedestrians walking through a, the middle of the block. So we're going to need a little more time to re-engineer this because we had to start over again because of the change in location. Uh, Councilman Aquero. Thank you, Council President Lanny. Um, the reason why it was a change from Berkeley to Appleton, it's Appleton um, runs uh, perpendicular to the um, playground that's at the uh, Bain Field there. So more pedestrians would cross at Appleton instead of Berkeley. Um, if the if Mr. Cody would like me to continue this to the next Council meeting up, it's, it's fine. I mean, abundance of caution, I don't have a problem addressing this at the, um, would be the October meeting. Motion to continue to the October meeting. I have to withdraw my motion. Through the chair, we, we have a motion pending yeah. by Council. But so if Councilman Akita will withdraw his second, I will withdraw my motion. Yeah, I'll withdraw my second. I will withdraw my motion. A motion to uh, continue. Uh, continue to the next Council meeting. Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stikos? Yes. Councilman Botts? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Isidro? Yes. Councilman Santa Maria? Yes. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. Uh, Finance Committee, uh, Councilman Stikos. Uh, we have a resolution authorizing real estate and tangible tax abatements as recommended by the tax assessor. Motion to approve. Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stikos? Yes. Councilman Botts? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Aceto? Yes. Councilman Santa Maria? Yes. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. Uh, we have a resolution, uh, as we do every month, authorizing motor vehicle tax abatements as recommended by the assessor. Motion to approve. Second. Motion been made and second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stikos? Yes. Councilman Botts? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Aceto? Yes. 
Councilman Santamaria? Yes. Council Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. Uh, we have a, uh, a approval of tax interest waivers as we do every month Motion as recommended by the city treasurer. Motion to approve. Second. Motion been made and second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stikos? Yes. Councilman Botts? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Aceto? Yes. Councilman Santa Maria? Yes. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. And finally, we have an application for a tax incentive from CR, CMR Enterprises, which is Rafa Yoga. Uh, and that was uh, recommended by the Finance Committee. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to made and second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stikos? No. Councilman Botts? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Aceto? Yes. Councilman Santa Maria? No. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. Motion passes on a vote of 7-2. Uh, safety Services License Committee. Council Thank you, Council Committee. President. Uh, ordinance 81302, Ordinance Amendment of Title 5.64 of the Code of the City of Cranston. 2005 entitled Theatrical Performances, Shows, and Exhibitions, Public Entertainment. This was amended in committee on uh, September 9th. Uh, uh, committee recommends passage. Motion to approve. Motion been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion on the motion? Councilman um, Stikos. Yes, uh, I wasn't at the committee meeting on this. Could you just give me a brief uh, summary of what this does and why? Uh, as you know, that uh, we had to go before DBR, the applicant um, 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 was against the $1,000 fine and the um, our ability to restrict their public entertainment license. Um, DBR asked us to make the ordinance a little bit more um, uh, within the boundaries of uh, the state law, but um, I know Attorney Kirschenbaum wanted to speak on it, so he probably can give you a better synopsis of what's going on. Attorney Kirschenbaum. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, President. Essentially what happened through a uh, court, through a hearing through the DBR, was that uh, this, through the safety service uh, committee fined a particular license holder for having entertainment. Within the course of that litigation, it was pointed out by the license holder to the hearing officer that the city had not promulgated certain standards on restricting entertainment. And that is found in Rhode Island General Laws 377.3. So as part of the decision by DBR, they said, you go back and put forth restrictions in compliance with this statute. So these are restrictions um, that was suggested that uh, Pat, your attorney, and myself write at the conclusion of a public hearing that was held uh, that deal with the type of standards that one would have in regulating live entertainment at a license holder of a B-class license. And there were many things that went into this when Pat and I started working on it. Um, there were many things that were taken into account uh, for the ordinance. And the, the main difference, what I can tell now, is that this license applies to all license holders that have a class B license, not just ones over 100. Uh, the problem that we saw in communicating with the fire chief was that if it's under 100, there were many establishments that could escape scrutiny from, let's say, the fire department, whereby if they took out their tables and chairs, their capacity would be dramatically altered, and they would so-called not be rated for certain safety things that the fire may want to know about. So what this, does, this ordinance does is it requires a person who wishes to have entertainment to describe the type of entertainment that they're going to have, to draw a schematic for the fire department, 
so that they can see how the place is going to be set up when there is entertainment. They have to comply with certain noise ordinances and the committee has some criteria as to community standards as to what the committee deems appropriate for entertainment in the city. So long answer short, this is not a situation whereby I, uh, Mr. Quinlan or the city council uh, are seeking to generate fees or to stick its nose into something it shouldn't. Uh, this was an, um, an attempt by DBR to have us create certain standards under the context of one ancillary court case that really has nothing to do with the standards before you today. Thank you. Uh, Council uh, Vice President Farina. Thank you, Council President. Um, briefly, this is a restrictive ordinance. It's not something I think anyone on this council wants to pass, but it's something based on the DBR court case we need to pass. We have to create a standard by which we can judge establishments. And sadly, this is the standard based on vetting, meetings, and hearings that we've landed on. So I'm going to support this. Thank you. Councilman Akedo. Thank you, uh, Council President Lanny. Uh, through the chair to the city solicitor, Mr. Christianbaum. What yep. questions, Evan? Um, does this, uh, if this ordinance passes, do we treat establishments that have capacity of over 100 the same as those that have the capacity of under 100? The, the, the same plan It's field? essentially the same criteria. Okay. It's the same plan uh, field. Are, are all the fees the same? We haven't done a fee structure yet. The, the, the fee structure has not been developed yet. We have the standards in place, which was the first part. And the next part, if this passes, I assume where the council will have input into what it charges, fees, if, if any, to certain establishments. So this is the skeleton and the rest of it has to be added on? Well, the, the fee part is certainly more administrative in, in nature. Uh, this portion was to draw us into compliance with existing state law. Interestingly enough, although it was a requirement in the case that Pat and I tried, uh, when we researched this, we found that no other city had in fact, submitted these to Rhode Island. So this, this council has the, um, the good fortune of being the first. But it is a state law. Uh, and this is the, really the only way by which a safety service committee or the city council can regulate public entertainment. And really what it is, it's a protection on the applicants so that they're judged by the same standards so people have the confidence to know when they come before the council that your decision, not that this council will do that, but that your decision is based on criteria and standards that are before it. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Council President. Councilman Santa Maria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be voting for this again along the same lines as the Vice President said. Um, I don't, I think it uh, punishes and that's a, 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 the um, people under 100 who have live entertainment and follow the rules. Um, however, the DBI has spoken, and I will be supporting this. But I really think that it's basically one business that's causing this restrictive, as Council Vice President Farina put, ordinance. Thank you. Councilwoman Lee. Um, I guess, I, as other council members have, have mentioned, I'm, I'm concerned that it, that it might um, uh, create a burden for the smaller establishments um, as far as extra fees and things like that. And I had a question as far as um, if, if they could get um, permission to have a regular event, like an ongoing, like every, you know, somebody coming every, they don't have to get repeated um, well, the, sec the second question first, and that is, can someone have, apply for different events? And yes, you can say you're going to have, you know, this event on Monday night and this event on Tuesday. And as long as you... But an ongoing... Ongoing is fine. Okay. You do not have to come in... So you can get one for That's correct. the whole year... That's correct. ...for every Monday night. That's correct. Okay. And what I would suggest is, although I understand this council's concern about small business, and believe me, 
my, my, my concern is there as well. I think you have to balance that concern with uh, the safety services ability to regulate what goes on in neighborhoods and the different concerns that we have all heard uh, sitting here about the inability that you would have to restrict any entertainment at any venue under 100 in the city. Okay, thank you. Councilman Aceto? Uh, yeah, just to uh, ex expand a little bit on uh, Councilman Lee's point, I think some of us uh, are very sensitive to the fact that probably 99.9% .9 of the establishments were oper operating within the law and following the rules. Mm -hmm. um, that 0.110 ruined it for everybody. However, I think we're also sensitive that, that for the small person who might have it on occasion, you know, I mean, we're not doing this to charge them another hundred dollar fee or anything like that. I mean, when it comes time to discuss what the fee structure is, I think we're all going to be very accommodating and we can tier it. There could be a tiered system. And I think that's, you know, perfectly legal to do and whatnot. But we're especially sensitive to the smaller places and the smaller owners because we definitely didn't want to put that restriction on them, so. Uh, Councilman Botts. Thank you, Council President. Through the chair to Solicitor Kirschenbaum. Um, I think I know the answer to this anyway, but I'm going to ask it. What, what happens if this ordinance would not pass? If this ordinance were not passed, uh, what would happen is the city would not have objective standards uh, by which to regulate entertainment in the city. I would suggest for those under 100 and perhaps over 100 at this point. Would the city be uh, conflicting state law? Would, the, would we be? The city would be in vile. The city would would give away some of its power uh, because they would have the inability to regulate or prohibit uh, entertainment in any license holder who had a Class B liquor license, regardless of size. Regardless of size. Thank you. Councilman Aceto. Just one fi final comment um, to Councilman Botts. We didn't want to do this. We were told by DBR. Which, which is why I asked and, that. And, exactly. We were told by DBR, and I think that something unique is as the solicitors were trying to come, coming up with the ordinance, they had to search far and wide. But I mean, um, the fact that I, I spoke to some people um, in Providence on the liquor board there, they, they think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, the mere fact that we're actually um, regulating everybody under one umbrella uh, is just something that I think they're probably going to copycat something in a few months themselves. But uh, we didn't want to do this. It's just a matter that, uh, you know, I think we kind of would be in contempt if we didn't do anything according to DBR. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if you'd be in contempt. Uh, you might. You might get an adverse ruling in the particular case that was before DVR. Uh, you know, a judgment may enter for the p particular case. But, I mean, this ordinance really isn't about that case. I mean, the, the, uh, the attorney for the applicant in that particular case brought to light this need to do this. So, from that extent, I appreciate it. Councilman Botts. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, just my main concern is with the small businesses. Uh, I mean, we charge them license fees for pool or a pool table if they want to have a pool table. If we, if they want to have one of those little video game machines on the bar, we charge them a license fee for one of those. And my concern is this is just one more burden on these small businesses. You know, they have to come before us now, apply for that license again, whatever minimal fee we decide. But you know. A thousand paper cuts by you know death by a thousand paper cuts these small businesses suffer and that's my main concern but if you're saying that now if we don't pass this ordinance that anyone above the 100 is beyond our control then obviously we're I mean, between I, a rock and a hard place I mean I I don't have an interest in what you decide to set up as a fee I don't have it doesn't diminish the efficacy of this ordinance if you were to set the fee at zero if you were to make it free. That wouldn't offend me in the least. But the ability to regulate and the, the ability to uh, monitor the neighborhoods for what's good for the people that live there, 
I know this council is always taken seriously, and that's really what drives a lot of the traffic in this chamber is neighborhood type of concerns. Thank you. Councilman Santa Maria. Thank you, Council President. I'll be brief. Attorney Christian Baum, this will not in any way affect our ability to limit, uh, put restrictions on licenses. Is that correct? Uh, in, in fact, this enhances the ability because now uh, an applicant cannot go or appeal your decision to DBR saying that the decision was arbitrary, that we will have criteria by which I would suggest the committee look at the criteria and address the criteria in the ordinance, uh, almost as if uh, findings of fact in a courtroom, uh, like we find that you know it's too close, or we find that they're too loud, or some kind of standard that you can point to to create a record so that what you do in your hearings will have a greater chance of being upheld later on. Okay. Any other questions? M Mr. President? Yes, Councilman yeah, Just one, one final quick comment. Um, I didn't notice anybody in the public uh, section voting, uh, talking for or against this, and uh, I know we were accused of uh, doing this in the backroom deal and whatnot, so I think that uh, the fact that it took 20 minutes maybe to discuss this uh, ordinance again in public so that uh, everything was up front, I think that needs to go on the record, uh, especially uh, in light of what the uh, the gentleman who was representing a certain client was saying about this ordinance. So, any other discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stikos? Yes. Councilman Botts? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Aceto? Yes. Councilman Santa Maria? Yes. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. Note it's passed unanimously. Thank you, Council President, uh, very much for that, uh, for your time on this matter. I know it's taken a few years, but I thank you very much for your time. Our claims committee, uh, Councilwoman Lee. Um, there are no claims to report. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, moving on to public hearings. Anybody in the public like to speak on any undocketed subject? Please come forward, give your name and address for the record. Docketed or undocketed? Want to say hi to your council people? No? <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, public hearing is now closed. <laughs> Election of city officials, uh, the juvenile hearing board, uh, Christine Aronian, alternate term ending December 1st, 2013. She will be replacing Joseph Rhodes. <coughs> this is submitted by Councilman Botts. Motion approved. Second. Motion to make a second. Any discussion? Council President? Uh, Councilman Botts? I'm sorry. I just want to ask a real quick question. Will her name have to come up again in December? That's so this is just for the... That's what I've been told by the city clerk, yes. The tail end of the term. Thank you. Councilman Botts. Yeah. Thank you, Council President. Um, Mrs. Horoyan uh, contacted me uh, recently about uh, wanting to be on the uh, Juvenile Hearing Board again. And um, as you know, there's a grapevine in Cranston. I had known uh, Mr. Rhodes had moved out of the state and uh, suggested to her that we could um, nominate her as an alternate for um, the Juvenile Hearing Board. Um, she also told me, and, and you can see on her resume, that she did serve in this capacity uh, once in Warwick as well. So she does have experience doing this, so I would recommend uh, approval. She also happens to live in my ward, so uh, that would be a great thing for her too. Thank you. Any other discussion concerning the subject? Hearing none, clerk, please take the roll. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stikos? Yes. Councilman Botts? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Ixito? Yes. Councilman Santa Maria? Yes. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. Uh, moving on, report of city offices. Hearing none. Executive communications. Thank you, Council President. 
Cranston Police Department Major John Shaffron is requested to be placed on the pension roll. Major Shaffron has met all the necessary requirements and we urge your approval. Motion to approve. Cap Council President, if we could deviate from protocol, Colonel Plum would like to say a word. Please come forward. Thank you, Council President, members of the Council. I'd like to address the Command Staff Officer of Distinction on the eve of his retirement. Major John Shaffron served the city with honor and distinction for over 27 years. He's among the highest decorated members of the Command Staff and in the history of the agency. Numerous felony arrests. His street proficiency has been only matched by his administrative acumen. He assisted us in implementing the command area policing model currently in use. He is a friend, a mentor, and a leader to everybody left in this room after two hours, sir. <laughs> uh, may each of us who wear the uniform serve with his level of dedication and courage and kindness. <coughs> well done, Major. Major Shepard, would you like to say a few words? No. <laughs> After 27 years, all of a sudden you became quiet. <laughs> Congratulations. This entire city council uh, wishes you the very best in your retirement. You've done an outstanding job in your 27 years. I think everybody in this council is well aware of your record and, and what a great officer you were, or are, and what a great person you are. Thank you for for the city of Cranston offers you his very best in your retirement. Thank you. Councilman Santa Maria. May I just say a quick uh, thing? <laughs> Who's gonna do safety services now for me? <laughs> <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for all the times that you answered my phone calls on a Saturday or a Sunday. You're always there when I needed you, when the city needed you. So thank you for being there and uh, enjoy your retirement. I promise I'll take your cell phone number off. Thank you. Okay, moving on, I guess. Council Through the chair? Point of order. We, we, yes, we, we never voted. We, we, don't, we don't want to keep him here any longer. We didn't want him to vote. <laughs> so if we don't take the vote, you can't retire. <laughs> Not so fast. <laughs> Go ahead, please take. Councilwoman Lee? Yes. Councilman Stikos? Yes. Councilman Box? Yes. Councilman Arquetto? Yes. Councilman Aceto? Yes. Councilman Santa Maria? Yes. Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. Now we'll move on. <laughs> uh, Council President Communications. Recently, uh, we had floods in Cranston on Oak Lawn Avenue. And today, matter of fact, I spoke to one of the residents in that apartment complex. <coughs> he wasn't on the first floor, he was on the third floor. But he had to evacuate his residence. Red Cross was there to help him out. They gave him a voucher for food for about $107. And they put him up for two nights in a hotel or a motel. And I was saying to myself, gee, at least he got a little bit of help. But then I thought, of all the help we've done for places like Perkin at Perkins Avenue with flooding, and I'm saying, what's the difference between a tenant who lost their possessions or a homeowner who lost their possessions? The loss is greater, that's all it is. They're both Cranston residents, and I think there should be some solution to a problem to be able to help people in this type of situation. I know it's a state problem. I know it's a state road. I know it's state drains. And I know the city of Cranston is really not responsible for that flooding. But they are Cranston residents. And I wish there was some way that we can get together to help these people. And I'm going to ask the administration to look into uh, whatever procedures are available or whatever can be done to help these residents. If uh, Mr. Lopez would like to comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Council President. 
Um, for the record, I would like to uh, inform the council that um, the mayor, uh, on the day after the, um, the situation at Dean Estates happened, uh, convened various agencies, uh, social service agencies, uh, such as uh, CCAP, the Red Cross, um, and uh, we even provided some legal services uh, for the uh, residents through uh, Rhode Island Legal Services to try to help them uh, with some of the situations that are there and some of the ones that you described. Um, however, this is one of those situations where we are between and betwixt. Because of the nature of the flooding being a localized, isolated incident, um, we could not, in good conscience, or judiciously utilize taxpayer funds and taxpayer um, uh, facilities or services uh, for this particular group of people. Um, one, it didn't meet the threshold for us to open up a shelter or anything of that sort. And the only location that we would have available for a shelter would be the Cranston Senior Center. And as you may or may not know, uh, the Senior Center provides essential services such as daycare and a federally mandated and federally controlled uh, meal program, which uh, would, those services would be disrupted by having those people there. And also, uh, there is not an adequate shower facility um, with all that being said, though, Council President, um, I can tell you that I personally have worked with some of those people to try to help them, uh, point them in the right direction to the United Way, the 211 system, uh, working through CCAP, uh, working with uh, Rhode Island Legal Services uh, to try to help them uh, in situations where um, they didn't have renter's insurance, uh, some people had just moved in and they wanted the deposit back. All things that um, these people need help with, but really the city should not and cannot get involved in, but at least we've pointed them in the right direction to the agencies that exist to try to help them. And if there's any other people who are still out there who need some assistance or need to be connected with a service, uh, you know, they can certainly call me and I'd be happy to try to help them out, um, you know, in connecting them to the proper agencies. All right, thank you, Mr. Lopez. I will direct some of those calls to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilman Aketo. Thank you, Council President. Just to uh, extend what uh, your comments, Council President, as you're well aware, we, we were out that day, we, we had a dinner, but I, I'd like to commend the uh, Cranston Fire Department, the Cranston EMTs, and, and other city workers that responded to Oakland Avenue. And as I said, I, I was out that afternoon, so I ended up driving by Oakland Avenue. It was very difficult to get through. But uh, most of all, I, I'd like to commend the mayor. Mayor Fung uh, was with the council president and myself um, at, a, at a dinner, and he uh, received a, a phone call from, from uh, Chief Palumbo, and he immediately left. Uh, with uh, Mr. Lopez to attend to the uh, the deluge and the disaster that was going on at the time. So I'd just like to give kudos to Mayor Fung and, and Mr. Lopez. Uh, continuing on the council communications. Anybody else from the council? I believe I have one, Council President. Council um, I know um, I wanted to thank the administration for taking care of the problem at Meatball Mike's. Uh, that didn't need to go on this. I also wanted to thank the administration. I called uh, Director Lopez last night regarding the issue with contaminated water in the city, and he got back to me within five minutes so I could tell constituents that we were okay in Cranston, that the news reports were egregiously overstated about as to the issue of the uh, contaminated water, so thank you. And I did have one follow-up that I would have emailed you. I don't like to blow up your spot tonight at the council meeting, but uh, on A Street, a constituent called me. There's a no-through trucking sign that's blocked by trees and trucks have been going up and down A Street. Um, and there was an issue where a little girl was almost hit the other day. So he called me tonight and actually told me about that. And I wanted to see if, and I did drive by and did see the sign was blocked by trees. So either if the sign, the trees could be trimmed or the sign could be moved out. So the sign could be seen. Uh, Councilman Farino, that, that uh, sign location is a frequent flyer with us. What we usually do is we trim the tree back. So uh, I'll be happy to send the uh, tree crew there to trim that back. Thank you. 
as a follow-up, the, the constituent actually lives in the house where the sign is, and he had questioned, is there a possibility of moving out, it out a few feet so this doesn't, so it's not something we keep having to go out and do? I can certainly ask about thank, that and thank you. see what we can do. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Councilwoman Lee. Um, I wanted to just uh, bring up the um, idea that I've been researching is to having a dog park in the city of Cranston, and they have dog parks in um, other cities. And um, when I talk to people, the number one question is where. <laughs> so I wanted to just make sure I um, reached out to everyone and, and uh, take any suggestions uh, of places and so we can find the best possible place if um, that seems like something that is doable. And um, uh, I guess um, I feel like with the right place, it could be a win-win for both the dog lovers and, and even the dog haters as um, some of the nuisance uh, animals uh, with enough exercise can become uh, a quieter and, and with a common place with proper receptacles, uh, you might have less mess on the sidewalks. And, um, and also the, the um, service that a facility like that would um, create uh, or provide to the community. It, um, there are a lot of people who, who get to know each other and have um, a very relaxing time in the evening walking their dogs and, and chatting. And, um, and I think it would be a very um, nice thing. And uh, the model that other communities have is, is usually they get together um, a, uh, a committee of citizens with dogs and, and they do some fundraising because I know that the funds and the liabilities are um, going to be a concern. Um, this was something that was brought up um, a few years back, and, and those uh, issues were brought up uh, back then. And I've talked to a lot of other towns that have these dog parks, and they haven't had any, um, any liability issues. The, uh, the parks police themselves, they have very well um, um, noticed or, you know, signage up with the rules um, and everyone stays in compliance or else the other people with dogs get um, upset. And uh, I guess any questions? It seems like people are, that, that's, go ahead. I'm done. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, you also wanted to speak about. Um, oh, do you want me to finish my? I just saw my. Oh, my right, other people had questions, it seemed. Or should I just. The other docketed item I have on uh, <coughs> communications, do you want me to go through that? The Brayton Avenue. Um, okay, uh, I'll finish that. Um, I, it was brought to my attention that. Um, the right of first refusal that CLCF has uh, on the uh, Brayton Avenue <coughs> field uh, was um, was a problem for them. Uh, they, I think, uh, Joe Ruggieri, uh, I don't know if he's still here, but he 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 was specifically the unclad. So he, uh, he called me and um, said that they had requested uh, use of the field and were denied. And then when he went by, he saw that the field was not being used. And so that, I thought that was um, something that uh, was of concern. So I wanted to be sure that that was not happening regularly and uh, see if um, that the management of the field was, was done properly. So if there's a, I don't know, if we can compare the use of the field and the times that he was asking, or if there's, you have a report, okay. Um, that that would be great. Thank you. Mr. Libertari, please approach the bench. Okay. For cross examination. <laughs> I, I couldn't think of a better term at the time, so cross examination just didn't hit me at the time. <laughs> Do you have a question? Um, um, I guess the question is, um, if the field was requested and denied, and then for some reason, or for the question is, for what reasons would it not have been used during that time? I don't believe 
it was ever requested officially by anybody. I think what Mr. Ruggieri stated was that he or some friends of his may have wanted to go use the field and were told they couldn't. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how Little League and softball works. Every league, which there are five in this city, has their own complex. Okay? Just the way the six wards in this city had their own council person. It's cut up in districts. There are 16 districts in this city. Six wards. How do people vote for you? They have borders. Little League has borders. When you play for Cranston National Little League, that is where you practice, that is where you play games. If you play CLCF softball, that is where you practice, where you play games. We don't have any overlapping. That's how you maintain, you can say, control or keep chaos out of the equation. Stay within your borders. CNB has no business at CLCF fields. Edgewood South Elmwood has no business at Cranston American fields. Everybody has their own. I seen an email that went around by Mr. Ruggieri claiming that these parks should go back to the control of parks and recreation. They have always been in control, all controlled by parks and recreation. When someone wants to use a field, they request a permit. If no one's using it, they get to use the field. I met with CNB board members two weeks ago. When they move from CLCF, and I'm gonna use this term very loosely, when they broke away from CLCF and joined Cranston National, they went from four fields of Braden Avenue to one at CNB with 160 some odd girls. Now, they requested that the T-ball field be converted to a softball field at Cranston National. Now they have two fields. We have given them Western Hills and Cooney softball. Now they have four fields. They had four at Brayton before they broke away. They now have four at CNB. What more could they possibly want? Any other questions? The other question? Please. Oh, I, I just had that one question of the allocation and, and uh, you know, if- We all live within our borders. Okay, I didn't understand that they have specifically, uh, you know, designated areas. It just keeps everything smooth. Okay. Uh, Council of Santa Maria. I have one quick question, Tony. Um, when we uh, did this one in the Cranston Western, the same ordinance, wasn't there a concern about out of city concern, um, uh, concerns playing on the fields? That's correct. So step one was really to, to make sure that Cranston residents got to use the field, right? So we get that, that equation out, Providence and West Wall, whoever was using our field. That's correct. Okay, so, and I know how, because my dad's been in a little league since I can remember, so He's I know that they're- almost as old as me. <laughs> so I know that they, um, they break into wards and, and, and everything like that. So is it your feeling that everyone has enough fields to play with the number of people they have? More than enough. Okay. Remember, at one so, time at Braden Avenue, okay. there were over 360 girls. Okay, so 160 now, split away from it. Now, what I'm failing to see is where the problem is then. Maybe one of the, one of the parents can get up and tell me what the Maybe problem is. Maybe Mr. Ruggieri? I don't know, I'm, I'm not gonna speak. That's to, to, up to the council president, so. Council President, it's up to you. Uh, why don't you hold off, Mr. Ruggieri, until some of the members of the council cross-examine Mr. Libertari first, <laughs> then we'll cross-examine you. Uh, Councilman Botts? I'm never gonna live that down. 
Thank you, Council President, through the Chair, Director. Um, I just had a question, actually, uh, while you were here, about the uh, other uh, item the Councilman brought up was a dog park. Do you have any feelings about dog parks in the city, or? Well, first of all, if we put a dog park in the eastern side of the city, say, let's say we hypothetically did it in Ward 2, <laughs> people in Ward 6 are going to say, why do they have a dog park? What? It's going to be a dog park which is probably going to turn into six dog parks. Makes it six times more expensive, six times more to maintain. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Uh, Council Vice President Farina? Then Councilman Pavecchio. I, too, understand how the uh, Little League process works. But was there an official request from the League to use, a diff use the field? From CNB? Absolutely not. And let's not say, through my office. Let's say hypothetically they did, and no one was using it, and CLCF didn't want it. Could they use the field? Simple answer. If the person making the request from CNB showed me that all four fields of CNB were being utilized on the date that he was requesting Brayton Avenue, yes. Thank you. As long as they didn't have something going on. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Director Libertori. Councilman Favecchio. Thank you, Council President. Through the chair to Mr. Libertori. So I guess uh, Mr. Ruggieri is associated with the other uh, league. Is that, uh, is that what you're telling me, the CMB? Um, left uh, CLCF softball and moved on and joined CNB softball. And that, so that was, his request supposedly was from another, another league, basically. Even though they're within the city, it's from another league. And, and to your knowledge, the fields had, were not um, utilized completely in their own uh, section. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Councilman Santa Maria. Councilman, can I reiterate my request to, to get the side of the parents? What's, what's, what's the, I, I, I'm failing to see what the issue is. Right. Well, we're going to bring up Mr. Ruggieri for okay. cross-examination as soon as we dismiss Mr. Libertori. <laughs> Any other questions? You are dismissed. I'm, I'm just going to sit here in case I have to return. All right, Tony, in case we have to call you back up. Mr. Ruggieri. <laughs> uh, okay. I to Fine. Just give your name and address for the record, please. Good evening, my name is Christopher Gentili, and my address is 51 Eden Crest Drive in Cranston. Um, uh, unfortunately for Mr. Libertori, we had numbers that were probably superseded the fields we needed this year, which we had had a discussion on before. And there were times we had number, you know, three teams show up at one field for the same practice off-site. Um, it isn't obviously easy for his staff to, to take into account that there are two leagues operating. Uh, one that really does not use their fields to the fullest and has a lot of empty fields or has uh, teams from out of the city playing on those fields at uh, different times. Uh, whereas we have been, in, you know we've been in situations where we have had, we've been short fields. And that has occurred. And also, you know, the, um, there's been questions as to which fields we were allowed to use and the state of those fields as to whether they were deemed safe enough for us to play on or practice on. And I obviously I was enlightened by Mr. Libertori about the difference between practice and game play. But one of the, my retort to that obviously was that uh, if it was safe for a, if it wasn't safe for a game, how on earth could it be safe for a practice uh, when the same same items occur? We are not looking to take over CLCS fields. I question and I wasn't here and it's shame on me when this resolution was passed by any special interest group would, would get rights to a public a city's public field, at least in writing, when no one else seems to get that. Uh, but that being said, our biggest question is, and our biggest problem is, satisfying the need for fields. You know that we had a lot of girls, all we're looking for is safe fields that can satisfy all of our needs, but our needs, unfortunately, were not met this past spring. If that requires better communication, well, Mr. Gentili, mm -hmm. you have to address the council. I'm sorry. Okay. sorry. If it requires better communication, I think that's something we're all willing to do. 
And while I understand there are growing pains, there are, every girl in that, in that league is, a ta is from a tax-paying family and has rights to play in a league on city fields, as everybody else does. And that's the important thing. We have to be able to satisfy those groups, all girls, for the, you know, we haven't gotten into any reasons why we left. We don't want that to be any part of this discussion. We just wanted to make sure that we have access to any fields necessary to perform what we have to perform as a league. Okay. Uh, Mr. Council Vice President Farina. Did you request usage of a field? I think it was done informally as we were not aware of how the process worked through the resolution that was passed. We don't know exactly how to go about it. We were also under the understanding that we were supposed to go see the current president at the time of CLCF, Mike English. And we have, we have copies of letters sent to Mike English, which were, which were turned down and denied. We didn't go to you, Mr. Libertor. We thought that the process was to go to, to Mr. English. And I'm the uh, first, Councilman Santa Maria, you had a question. Can I just ask a quick question? So you agree with Mr. Libertori that you have use of four fields? Well, I agree that there's no, well, that's not in dispute. That's what we were given for use. Okay, you got, you got four fields. But we need a little bit more. We need okay. more safe, qualified fields. All right, so your issue is not, is not that the, the number of fields, it's the condition of the fields. No, we do need more than, correct me if I'm wrong, we need more than four fields, to, to, especially one of them is a, is a special use field for t-ball or, or Eight, you softball. Okay, so now you need more than four. It's not correct. The, you just said the condition of the fields was not. Well, we can get into that as well because that is an extended part of that process. One of those fields was uh, Florida Avenue, and one of those fields was was Tate. Um, okay. I mean, where would you like me? I don't know where you'd like me to direct it. We feel that we need, and it's kind of been borne out that we need more than the fields we have. That's all. How many more? One more, in my opinion, one more legitimate field f for, with uh, unrestricted uh, use, the ability to use that field would probably be our biggest. So he's giving you four, and you need, is that, is, just talk with me, yes, do you need it, five? Yes, we do have four, we do have four. We feel we would need at least five to, to get done properly, correct? It would, okay. it would be based on the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Hang on Christopher. a Christopher. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Paul, Paul, Paul Bissett, I live at 100 Stone Drive in Cranston. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul Bissett. Cranston, Rhode Island. I live at 100 Stone Drive. Um, and I'm one of the members that did leave, I'm sorry, I am one of the members that did leave CLCF for one reason or another, um, and we did go to CMB. Uh, we're not here to fight over how many fields we need or the, the, the status of the fields. We are a growing field in Little League, and I, I've worked with your father many a times in Little League, umpiring for him back in the day. But Little League with girls softball does not have boundaries. So any girl within the city of Cranston could play for one league or another. What we're trying to do is get one league within the city of Cranston. We are one of the only cities in the state of Rhode Island that does not have one dedicated fast pitch league in the, city, in the state of Rhode Island. I coach the Cranston East Varsity girls softball team and we do not have a dedicated fast pitch league for the city of Cranston. We do not have middle school sports anymore where we have a feeder system for the schools. What we are looking for is to provide the girls of the city of Cranston ample places to play softball in the city of Cranston. We understand that we left Brayton Park, but we left for reasons that are being taken care of by Mr. Libertori. We will leave that as where it is. What we are asking is for fields that we can practice on, play games on, because we do play teams from outside the city in rec games, whether it be Elmwood in Little League, Coventry, and so forth. But we do have over 160 girls that left CLCF and went to CNB. We expect over 200 girls next year with the product that we put on the field and showed what these girls in the city of Cranston can expect by the coaching we have. I was at that meeting with Mr. Libertori a couple weeks ago and we are satisfied with the four fields we have, but we are asking if the fields are not being used by CLCF, we understand this right of first refusal resolution, that they get the first refusal. If the fields are not being used by CLCF at certain times, 
we want to request to use the fields if needed be. That's all we're asking. We're not asking for anything else. Councilman Farina. And just as a follow-up, based on the statement the previous gentleman made, and we're not here to debate the politics of CLCF and CNB. Exactly. To be honest, I don't really care. Exactly. All I care is that the kids in this city have baseball fields and softball fields to play on. So it doesn't sound like an official request was made last year. It was well, more of a... There were, there were emails sent, sent to, to the, Mr. English. Not to my, the director of... No, because we, didn't, we were blindsided by this resolution. We had no idea. There were parents that were on the field at Brayton Park that were kicked off by Mr. English. And they weren't being used. So and what we're asking for is if the fields are not being used, to have permission to use it as teams from the city of Cranston. That's all we're asking for. Okay. And I think based on the way we wrote the ordinance and passed the ordinance, that mechanism does exist through direct deliberatory. And we understand that. And that's the process we, we, we took a step back when we found out that resolution came out. We took a step back and just let it go. Until the season ended, we approached Mr. Libertori and had a meeting. And we told him about the resolution. And if the fields were available for us to use, when CLCF is in use, it, can we use them? That was it. That was the crux of the meeting. And, and I will say as a follow-up, when we passed that, we told CLCF that if there was an issue and there were official requests that were going through to Director Libertori that were being denied and CLCF wasn't using the field, we would revoke their right of first refusal. So we can't really do anything until we know that you've gone through direct deliberatory and said, you know, we want the field on September 5th. And you drive by September 5th to take a picture and you say, listen, we requested the field, CLCF denied it because they were using it and no one used it. That's the mechanism we put in place when we passed it to try to alleviate the issue that, that we're talking about tonight. And we understand. Okay. Uh, Councilman Stegos. Hey, I just have a statement. I don't have a question, but uh, I'd just like to say I voted against the uh, right of first refusal, and I'll um, vote against anybody's right of first refusal, any league, uh, for the precisely the reason that was stated is that I think that the, the recreation director uh, does a really good job, and that's where the power should be, and we shouldn't be entering into legal agreements deeding rights to parks that are city property. Just for the reasons, some of the reasons that we've seen here, leagues change, um, interests in sports change, sometimes, you know, when I was a kid, nobody played soccer, right? Everybody played baseball. Well, now more people play um, soccer and these things change and so to enter into a, a long-term uh, agreement with anybody for a public facility um, that really needs to be regulated by the recreation director so I, I don't um, don't quite understand all the details of this dispute but I do think that these uh, rights of first refusal are a mistake and we should avoid them in the future. Councilman Akero. Oh. <coughs> you see though? Oh, see though, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> I would say something else, but I won't. Um, j j just for the record, again, I, I have to agree with um, Council Councilman Farina here. Um, and I do agree with Councilman Stikos. A resolution is a non-binding document. I mean, the recreation director is there 24-7 sometimes, and he gets the phone calls 24-7. I mean, obviously, if it's a viable league and it's operating in the city and you need more space, then you got to go through proper channels. I don't think this council is denying anybody playing. As a matter of fact, I used to have couple of younger kids who were pretty good athletes and played for CLCF, CLCF once and they got a little bit better and they played for other teams. And, and we followed the procedure from being out of the city, you know, to having two or three Cranston kids and follow protocol to rent a field or do things with a field. So, I mean, I think the protocol is there if you need the fields. I think you work with the Parks and Recreation Director because he's there every day. We're not. 
and see what you need. I mean, I think he'll accommodate you. He, he's very accommodating, and he's done a great job with it. So, um, you know, this resolution, resolution thing, it's non-binding. It's just the will. Although I agree with Mr. Libertori that you can't have total chaos where, you know, you can't have uh, uh, a little league from one side of the field take over another field. I mean, I think for control purposes, there's a lot of sense to the way he manages, manages some of the leagues. You know, so, but I mean, we hear you. Um, you need extra fields. You know, Mr. Libertori's here. He hears you. You know, the mayor's uh, administrative uh, director, deputy administrator's here. He hears you. I think it's just a matter of sitting down and see what you need and, and work it out. I don't think anybody's saying you can't use any of the fields. So. I have a quick Councilman Santa Maria. That's my last word on it. Um, why did you come to the council? I'm just kind of thinking, this is the kind of thing that could be settled over no, breakfast, I, I, you know what I mean, I or, or, a, or a glass of beer. I, I think, I, I, why are you before the council? I, I mean, we're, we're glad that you're here. Come more often, but I think this how can we, uh, how, how are we going to I think there's some underlying issues of why that resolution was made, and it was, well, uh, and it was, it, it, it's more of the reason we're here is to just open some eyes on, you know, girls softball in the city of Cranston. So everybody's aware of how much it's growing and how much, you know, the, the fields need to be utilized the right way. And we understand the resolution is nine, nine binding, like Council Minnesota said, and I concur with the Council Vice President. Um, this isn't a, an issue between CNB and CLCF and anybody else or Parks and Rec. This is parents found out about this resolution asked the chairman of CLCF to use the fields, they were denied. And then they find out that cities and towns from outside of Cranston use the fields. That's the only reason we're here. It's just to open up some eyes to say, you guys had the, uh, the resolution was passed and parents from our league were denied use of the field in cities and towns from outside the fields, uh, the city we use, use the fields. Mr. President, may I answer that please? But, uh, but if there's a certain process on how you apply for the fields, if you didn't follow the process, and whether it was somebody from CNB but or that was ABC, prior to the resolution or, that we or ABC or whatever, and they applied for the fields and they were available, you know. No, I, I understand, but that was prior to that resolution coming out that we had asked, and then we found out about the resolution. That's when we took a step back, and we never asked again until the end of the year, and now we. We found out that cities and towns from outside the city of Cranston use the fields. And that's why we're here, just to make the council aware that cities and towns from outside the city use the fields, and we were denied prior to the resolution. That's all. Councilman Botts, you had your hand up earlier? Uh, I was thinking about whether I should comment or not, but um, as a former president of CNB, uh, I kind of know the, in, the ins and outs of what happens and everything's political, whether it's within the league, whether it's between two leagues, whatever. There's always been an unspoken rule within Cranston that other leagues cannot use the other league's fields. I mean, I can't imagine the boys' little league from CNB going over to Edgewood or going over to American and getting practice time on their fields. It just doesn't happen. Now, if you set up interleague between the two, obviously that works. Um, also, I question whether is this under the auspices of CNB Little League or are these travel teams no, it's using? No. Because I know in girls softball there are travel teams. They're so up. And I, if, it's, if you're saying it's parents that went over there to use the fields, that's telling me it's not league coaches doing that. That means it's travel teams that are going over there and I can see where CLCF would have a problem with that. Now, if you go through the permitting process like these out of town teams probably are doing and they go to parks and recs and pull their permits, then they are well within their rights to go there and play on those fields. Obviously, if CLCF has an event, a practice, a game, whatever, scheduled there, they have that right of first refusal. So again, I think echoing what everyone else is saying is that if the, follow, if the protocol is followed and Director Liberatore seemed to go to the CLCF first and say, uh, do you have a, a, you know, anything scheduled on this particular day, at this particular time, can we issue a permit for the field? I'm sure it'll go fine, but to me, it, you're introducing anarchy, chaos, whatever you want to call it, when you start crossing into di different league fields. I, I would never think of going, when president's going over to 
Cranston Westfield and, and, and trying to use their main field for a practice time. It just doesn't happen. And I understand that Tate and Cooney aren't the best fields. I understand that they're suitable for practice. Whether I want to play a game there or not, I'm not sure, especially with other games going on. But you know what? To go over there and practice, there's no problem with that. And again, when I was in the league, we, uh, I forget if it was Western Hills or Cranston West, but there was a softball field over there that we used as well that was perfectly suitable for practices. And actually, that field wasn't bad if we had to schedule a game over there. So again, four fields seems to be plenty. If you have to play on grass a particular day to get practice time in, there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, so, I, I mean, again, I think as Councilman Santa Maria alluded to, I'm not sure why this is before the council when this seems to be, and I understand what you're saying in trying to make us aware that, and again, the resolution is non-binding, so I think this is, you know, the two leagues needing to get together with, with Director Libertori and trying to work something out here. So that's that's my that, opinion. That is, that is in the works. All right. Yeah, thank thank you. Not, I, we're, like I said, we're not here to cause mm -hmm. or anything. Just yep. if the fields aren't being used, we would like to have mm -hmm. a chance to use them. That's all. Yep. Uh, Councilman Farina, you'll love it. And to uh, expound on something that Councilman Bot said, you know, there may be these imaginary lines, but in reality, if you need the field and you're at capacity and you request it to direct a laboratory and no one's using it, you're a Cranston organization, you're going to get the field before anyone out of state, anyone out of city. And to have a parent request it through another league just, I mean, it's not protocol. And to expect that, and, and you know, we all understand that there's fields and we have great fields in the city of Cranston and everybody wants to use them and we want you to use them. Believe me, all of us on this council want you to use them. And even if that resolution was not in place and we tore it up today, you'd have the same problem you're having today because the protocol wasn't followed. And I think if we just open lines of communication, as Councilman Bott said, we can get this solved. Understood. Yeah. Councilman Stikos. Yeah, I just have a question. I don't know whether it's for uh, uh, Mr. Quinlan, Mr. Lopez. Uh, um, I remember those uh, rights of re first refusal, one of which was for uh, uh, at Cranston West and, and the one that we're talking about now. I remember them as, as binding legal documents that had beginning and d end dates. Did, am I uh, correct on that or in error? I'm not sure. I think I can look at it. I think it's on my document. I'd just like to get that clarified because people keep saying that they're non-binding and, and my impression was that they were binding. While he's looking up, Mr. Libertori, would you like to make a comment? Uh, right, the right to first refusal at Cranston West Verado Field was a five-year uh, five-year renewable, and the one with Brayton Avenue is a four-year renewable. But there are also clauses. Let's. There are clauses in these right to refusals that can be terminated by either party at any time if they don't go. Put the stipulations that were put in here. Okay. But, but they're binding. They're, right? I mean, they're an agreement that you have to follow. Right? That's correct. Okay. That's my point. They're not resolutions that don't mean anything. I, 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 I'd like to end this, but I have to end it with a statement. Uh, that's kind of up to the council president. Council president. president. I always listen to your sage advice. How this came before this council tonight is uh, basically because someone got in the ear of Councilwoman Lee and thought it was an issue. An email went out to all parents by Mr. Ruggieri to be here tonight to support going against the right to first refusal. Two weeks ago, Two board members of Cranston National, myself, and my general foreman, Rodney Ryan, met and came to an agreement on how this was going to be handled their fields. Mr. Botts made a good uh, statement about Cooney Field. It is no longer just a practice field. It's a damn good game field. And so is Western Hills, both practice and game. What the gentleman that was at the podium was alluding to was Florida Avenue, which was never a softball field, but we allowed him to practice. And what I meant by growing pains 
They only came to us last year that they were going to the CNB, where there was only one softball field. After the completion of one year, going into next season, they will have four fields, practice and game. And in the meeting I had two weeks ago, I told them the possibility of using a field now and then at Braden Avenue because CLCF blatantly violated this right to first refusal. Blatantly. I have all the evidence of how they abused it and how much money should have been coming to this department of Fox and Recreation and never a dime came because we weren't even told about the tournaments that were from Appenock, Pawtucket. But I, I'm forced to say these things because people behind me don't understand that I know what's going on in Parks and Recreation. But sometimes I can't talk about it when they force me to talk about it. Let me do my job and you coach softball a little late. I'm dealing with P.J. Bissett, he's the best, and we have come to agreements. Councilman Farina. One final, final question to Director Libertori. I know you're still doing your investigation and you have evidence, but should we consider revoking the right of first refusal to CLC? Not at this time, because okay. I'm not going through the city of Cranston, I'm going through the state, state police, because there's too many conflicts of interest. Okay, so we'll. I would like you to table until you hear from me again. Okay. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Director. Councilman Vivecchio. Thank, Thank you, Council President. I'll be brief. Um, obviously, there's a lot of conflict between the leagues. Uh, I guess some things never change. It's been a long time since I coached, uh, but um, maybe, maybe uh, for Director Libertori, maybe she just have a playoff game between the leagues and they can determine uh, how many extra days they get to practice. Um, but it sounds to me like there's a lot of internal politics and I think we should leave it up to Director Libertori. I second that one. I have full confidence in Tony will get it fixed. So uh, I don't think this should be for the council. It should be Tony's ball, excuse the pun. So. It wasn't a waste of time. I'm glad you came. I did. I'm glad we got it cleared up. But uh, he's your guy. He, he, uh, he'll be the enforcer. Okay. Uh, thank everybody for speaking. We all got an education this evening. Yeah. That there's more to politics than Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move on. Thank you again for coming tonight. Councilman Santa Maria. Thank you, Council President. Um, the ongoing Walmart request for local contact. Uh, Council, um, Carlos has an answer for me. Mr. Lopez. Thank you, Council President. Um, <clears throat> I've reached out to the, uh, own, the owners of the uh, plaza where Walmart is located and uh, he did respond to me, and if I could just read his response uh, into the record. Yes, please. And I do have a copy for Councilman Santa Maria also. Um, Mr. Lopez, I would like to take this opportunity to address the overnight parking concern at the Independence Park Shopping Center in Cranston, Rhode Island. We have signs posted around the lot, see attached, which I have pictures of, um, and perform regular random patrols in the parking lots in an effort to catch any trucks that are violating these restrictions. Our patrols are performed by our local day porter who has the authority to call the local police and a towing company to have these trucks removed. Our patrols are not seven days a week. They are performed on a random basis. Please remember that one of the tenants is Walmart and they receive many deliveries a day. It's very possible that their drivers need a place to park at the end of the delivery to catch up on their logbook, paperwork, or just take a quick break before they hit the road again. Please remember that we do not like the trucks in our lots because the parking lots are not designed to carry their weight. We will make an effort to curb any overnight parking that occurs, but we will not catch all the people that park there. I'm 
on another note, we do have an authorized agent in Rhode Island. I have attached the form from the Secretary of State's office to show proof of this, which I have a copy here. Um, I will not give out the information of our local day porter, however. If there is a problem at the center, you can contact Kellen David, and his email is provided here, the current property manager, or myself, um, Brian Wilden Hain, who's the person who we, we've been dealing with as our contact, by email only, and we'll be happy to listen and try to address your concerns. Thank you, Brian Wildenhan, property manager of TKG Management, Inc. So in addition to this email, I have spoken to uh, Mr. Wildenhain, and um, he has told me that they have not had more issues with overnight trucks parking there. Um, he said, he does acknowledge that there are trucks that park there during the day, but he said, look, it could be drivers that are just taking a break. They're going to McDonald's, grab a bite to eat, go into Walmart, use the bathroom, the facilities, and some of them might even be resting there during the day, maybe some in the evening. But he said that so far on their spot checking, they haven't had the same problems that they had before. So uh, I do think that uh, they are trying to do an honest job to try to uh, stop the overnight uh, trucks. Um, and they have uh, complied with our request to uh, put notices, which were lacking before, uh, informing people that they are not allowed to park there overnight. Um, and they've put up uh, both sets of uh, signs on the property. And um, I, I'm an admitted self, uh, self-admitted shopper at Walmart, and I'm there quite a bit. And I have seen trucks there, you know, in the afternoon, evenings, but um, I have not gotten a single constituent call about overnight trucks there in months now. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Uh, Council President, could I just add uh, three um, addresses? Um, I talked to Carlos Valenti Drive. Uh, the grass again needs to be cut on that foreclosure, Carlos. Also, 25 Vigilant Street, so the foreclosure, and the old Garzilli's Bakery, uh, which always seems to be overgrown. So, if you could check on those three. If you want to just give them to me, I'll, I'll give you the slip. Thank you, Council President. Uh, Councilman Stikos. Thank you. Yes, I, looking for a re, uh, report from the administration on the, the status of the Park Avenue Railroad Bridge, which uh, is chronically uh, a mess, and the uh, one of the sides, one of the sidewalks. On one side is not is is uh, boarded off, so that a pedestrian walking along that side of the street will then go and walk into the onto the bridge where the cars are, which is dangerous. And I'd just like to know what who's responsible for that bridge, what's happening with it. Lopez. Thank you. Um, as we've previously discussed about this bridge, this is a bridge that is a uh, state responsibility for uh, maintenance and upkeep. Um, since our last meeting and when we spoke about this, I've had uh, Director Mason reach out to the uh, RIDOT, and this is what they responded. The, rail, the bridge road surface will be repaved within the next three weeks. Repairs and reopening of the sidewalk is a much bigger issue that is still to be designed between RIDOT and the railroad. This is scheduled for bid in December of 2013 with possible construction sometime in the spring of 2014. Considering the um, agencies involved and um, the slowness with which RIDOT works, um, I would give them a lot more leeway than the time frame that they're suggesting. Uh, I didn't, th so within three weeks, they say they're, three weeks from when, what's the date of the letter? 
Uh, this uh, email is from Wednesday, September 18th. And they say within Wednesday, September 13th, you said? 18th. 18th. Okay. And so they're saying they're going to repair the surface. The road surface will be, the bridge road surface will be repaved within the next three weeks. And then what is the, the bid in December 2013 is for? Repairs and reopening of the sidewalk area. And, and that's scheduled for bid in 2013. Okay, and um, who is the, when someone calls and um, complains about that bridge, I assume you don't want me to have them call you. Who, who should they be calling? I, when I've received these phone calls, I refer them to the Governor's Office of Constituent Affairs and they take up the mantle and uh, go to uh, RIDOT and that number is 222-2080 and uh, my contact there is Will Kinsella. Will, what's the last name? Kinsella. K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A. -L -L Two L's? Okay. Um, all right, and could I get a copy of that email? Sure. Just to, all right. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, Councilman Aketo, did you have your hand up? Okay, Councilman Aceto, I believe it is. Yes, through the chair. Those um, vowels get me mixed up. Councilman Stoikos, I usually call the state reps and uh, <laughs> senators, and they seem to get a lot more done than the governor's office and DOT directly. So I don't know if um, you've used that tactic before, but I mean, they should know. They travel those roads every day like right. everybody else does. So but it seems to work quicker. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lopez. Uh, if I can. Uh, Councilman Psychos, can I get that email to you and Council of Abbots tomorrow because there's other items that were discussed that are not pertinent to that, so I can just isolate that email response. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Akedo. Thank you, uh, President Lenny. Uh, I would just like to request uh, to the uh, Council President uh, the next Public Works Committee meeting if we could have on the agenda a discussion of the policy um, for enforcement of uncovered trash cans. I'd like to add that to the public works agenda the next right, meeting. Will the clerk please add that to the, on the new business to the public works? Thank you, Council President. Don't you need to ask the chair first? Councilman Vivecchio. Thank you, Council President. Um, I, in following up on your earlier comment on the flooding, um, I had a call from a constituent in Garden City. They might have been here tonight on the other issue. Um, and I wasn't really too concerned about it until they sent me photographs of the, um, of the flooding. And uh, I, maybe we could put this on the flood committee agenda um, just to, to review. This is Delwood Road in uh, Garden City. It, it's amazing how much flooding. Uh, now, these are private, these are private residents. Um, I'm not sure what we really could do except to maybe refer them to someone. but. Um, it was pretty uh, severe, so I don't know, uh, you know, perhaps we should at least take a look at it. So I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to add it to the flood committee agenda, agenda with the chairman's approval, okay. Any other questions or comments on the? Yeah, Council I just Macedo? want to follow up on the flood, Mr. President. Um, who, who actually has enforcement on some of those violations that like, for example, the bike path used to have, like, a lot of culverts and uh, little streams and stuff that seem to be all blocked off now. Would that be the Flood Commission that looks at that? Or do we have to have uh, DEM or somebody do an inspection and stop fining people? Well, the bike path is owned by the state, I believe. DOT owns it. Uh, if there's violations as far as streams that they block, they... I guess you have to get all the DEM to look at the state. Mr. Lopez, maybe you can help us with that. Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, Council Minasito, to, to, to your point, um, during the incident at Dina States, uh, Director Mason uh, walked the uh, path of the bike path itself, 
and uh, came across some culverts that do not appear on city maps and some culverts that do appear on city maps. Um, his best guess is that when those... Councilman Favicchio? Yes. Council Vice President Farina? Yes. Council President Lanny? Yes. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Good night.